get started. Hey, Ricky, you, know, you came up to this Thank you again for being here tonight. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start us off. It's typically Lee's job to do that, but he's running a little late, so I'm going to get us going here, and then we have uh, members of the city here as well. I'm Dave Javid. Again, good to see you, see you all. I wasn't here the last meeting, but I heard it was very exciting. Um, tonight's agenda, uh, welcome introductions. We're doing that now. I'm going to ask you to take a look at the minutes and someone to make a motion and go ahead and second, and we can get through that part. Uh, and then we're going to go through summary notes like we always do. We're going to give you a quick update on the engagement process to date, um, where, what we've done, what we're planning, get you up to speed on that front. And then the most exciting part is we're going to have TED Talks. We're going to hear from a bunch of you. I believe we have 12 to 14 um, presentations here tonight, so that'll be the bulk of the evening. Uh, and then we're going to give you a quick report out of the Housing Solution Group. Just a quick update on what they've been working on. It's not going to be a full report out. We'll have that later in the process, but we want to give you a quick snapshot of what's been discussed in that group, recognizing, obviously, that housing is a key topic in this process. Uh, then we'll have public comment, as always, and then we'll get through the next steps. So with that, can I ask someone to make a motion to approve the minutes from the last meeting? There's some errors. OK. Sure, you could do the microphone, yeah. Uh, Edward Salm, Shasta. Is it on? There you go. Edward Salm, Shasta, Hanchett Park Neighborhood Association. Uh, next steps, it has the regu next regular meeting date is June 20th instead of June 27th. Uh, public comment item five actually took place before item number three, not after. And to a certain extent, uh, the item number four ignores the elephant in the room and doesn't mention why Lee adjourned the meeting for 40 minutes. So I don't know if that should be mentioned as part of the minutes as well. That definitely should. Good catch, Edward. So with those edits, Kevin Christman, Greater uh, Gardner Neighborhood Association. Um, we did have public comment. Then we did have the adjournment, and then we had more public comments. There was so two we had sessions. It on both. Right. Yeah. Right. Five should be on the Yeah. Or after. Good catch. Yep. So with those adjustments, do you have one more, Steve? Steve McMahon, Center's Unified. I was present at the last meeting. Okay. And the minutes market absent. Yes, Harvey. Harvey's confirming I was here. Okay. <laughs> Par I participated wasn't. in quite a moment, according to, the, <laughs> according to the letter we have. I appreciate that. Sorry for the errors. Uh, anything else before we close this item? No. Could we get a motion with those edits? We'll make sure we make them. Thank you very much. Okay. So on we go to group agreements. I'm not going to spend too much time on these. You all have been fantastic and very respectful with each other. We want to continue that flow here tonight. A uh, quick summary and takeaways from the last meeting. Um, obviously, a bulk of that was the Google presentation. Uh, and you all had some great feedback, um, including appreciating the early vision and what's possible for the area and their understanding of the context. You felt that Google listened to what the SAG and community members have been proposing for the vision of mixed-use development. There was appreciation for incorporating some of the feedback from the neighborhood groups and the neighborhood walks. Um, but then there were some questions about how Google's buildings will fit into the overall vision, how the community benefits will be created um, to help beautify the area. And there was a concern for potential lack of uh, attention to displacement and affordability and gentrification and maybe some of those site amenities. Uh, there was support for a social street loop concept and partnerships that would be necessary to achieve that. Um, city's role in creating the public spaces was also a question of how that process is going to work. Uh, the sale, the land came up, um, and why, and if that'll be required, and we'll talk about that a little bit as we go here. Uh, and the project should acknowledge the history of immigration in the area. Um, Guadalupe River Park should be a key part. Google should contribute 
or should continue to consider how to expand opportunities to, for retail and connections between employees and retail businesses. The Santa Clara County Water District experience impacts of homelessness should be considered. Um, and there was a question of when the SAG will dig deeper into the housing issues, which we will be starting here tonight. So any questions or comments, for key takeaways from the last meeting before we move forward? Hearing none, I'm going to hand it over to Lori now to take us through what we've done thus far. Cool. Hi, everyone. This was my first meeting officially as the in charge. So of course, the food isn't here, and the PowerPoint copies aren't printed. So hopefully, they will be here soon. It's just a large packet given all the TED Talks. So we're trying to figure out a way to save a little paper and get those to you. So apologies. Um, with that, we've had a very busy month. Um, we've had uh, 10 total meetings in May and June for the solution groups. Uh, you've all attended at least one of those, so you know what they're about. Uh, we discussed issues and brainstormed lists of potential solutions. Most groups are going to do some type of prioritization exercise before the full report backs. Um, so at the end of this meeting, we'll go over the um, next few uh, advisory group meeting agendas and talk about when those report backs will be. But staff is working on those, uh, getting the meeting summaries from the second rounds back to you all and uh, working on the prioritization. So we also held two walking tours on Saturday the 19th and the 30th of May. Uh, they were pretty well attended, about 25 to 30 people. It was a great opportunity to get to see the area in person and talk to Bill Eckern, um, our Deer Dawn Station project manager. So we just held four community forums over the last week. Um, it was very exciting, uh, very well attended, great energy, a lot of passion, thoughtful feedback. Um, we did small group discussions where we were able to take notes on flip charts. So we will be posting those notes to the website, typing up all of the comments, uh, analyzing and summarizing the feedback from them and posting that all on the website, and of course, sending that around to all of you to read. So I hope you take the time to look through that. There's gonna be a lot of uh, material to comb through, but uh, people were asking, what is happening with this feedback? And you know, I was telling them that city staff is gonna read it, city council, and of course, the advisory group. So they're all um, wanting you all to take their input um, very seriously. I think you mean um, community forums four held in June, right? Yep. <laughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> okay, so we've held a couple pop-up workshops. Um, one at, on June 6th at the Spur Annual Party and June 16th um, at Dancing on the Avenue in Willow Glen. So we had a couple boards up, one with information and one for people to take sticky notes and write their thoughts. Um, it, we have the same three buckets that we've been going over in solution group meetings. So hopes and visions, uh, concerns and issues, and ideas or solutions. So we are looking to schedule at least several more uh, through summertime. And we will be posting on the website uh, when we, where we will be and when. Uh, another engagement activity that is in the works is to do a uh, text survey so people would see a code, uh, you know, text 349 to uh, Deer, sorry, text Deerdon to this code and it'll engage you in a text survey. So it's a good way to get um, quick feedback from a lot of different people, especially people who uh, don't want to or can't attend public meetings and like to engage electronically. Um, so look for more information on that soon. Uh, lastly, we are continuing to talk to community groups and plan stakeholder meetings or listening sessions as a way of sharing information about this project and the process and hearing from San Jose's residents and community leaders. So those are in the works and we'll also keep you posted on those. So any questions about the engagement process? Yeah. So relative to the, oh, I'm sorry, I'm Bill Souders from the Downtown Residents Association. 
uh, relative to the stakeholder groups, um, the community forums were held all outside of the core. I represent the downtown community groups. Um, I had a, a, a conversation with Dave actually about uh, conducting those but having us organize them and invite you rather than vice versa. I understand that you're also thinking about focus group kinds of activities similar to the um, community groups. Yeah, so I guess I'll just end with a question. What does this mean and who's involved in planning it? Because I'd rather not just get an email, I'd rather help plan it. Great, yes, and that's we would like that too. So if any of your groups are interested in planning something, let us know. And we know that your group would like to co-host co something with us so we can coordinate on an outreach event that reaches your group. And what are the deadlines? I haven't thought about a deadline. It's somewhat of an ongoing thing, but uh, as you all know, the goal for this process is to end with a comprehensive report in September that documents all of your feedback and all of the other feedback we've been getting. So with that, I would say um, August would be a good time to plan that, or late July. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anything else? No? Okay. All right, so the food has arrived. So I'm gonna ask you all if you wanna grab food to go ahead and do that now. The next step in the process is to do the TED Talks and as we get people up front and get the TED Talks ready, if you wanna grab some food, definitely feel free to do so. And this is the order of the TED Talks tonight. We're gonna start with Edward, Teresa, Nicole, Charlie, and Jonathan. Would you go back one slide, please? Sure. They're gonna come up every time we go through no, it. No, I understand it. Sure, sure. Yeah, just understand. get yourself familiar. Yeah. Focus. Does that work? Any questions, Harvey? Yeah? No. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So do you all wanna grab a quick bite before we get into the presentations? Yeah? All right. So when you're ready, if I can ask this group here to actually migrate over to this back table, that would be great. Thank you so much.
So with that, we're going to get started with Edward. Turn that on for you. Get it nice and close. There's your clicker back and forth right there. All right. Get close enough, but not too close. All right, good evening, everybody. I will do my very best to go against type and be brief, which doesn't come easily to me. Uh, my name is Edward Salm. I'm the president of the Shasta Hancha Park Neighborhood Association, and at the same time, I am the current chair of the City's Historic Landmarks Commission and a bicycle uh, commuter that rides to Deerdon every day. So in bringing all those together, the topic that I chose was the historic preservation resources within the Deerdon Station area and the immediate adjacencies. Start simple. Why is historic preservation important? Well, a development that is truly part of its context rather than just placed within it must acknowledge the community's unique architectural and cultural heritage. We've said that in a variety of ways that we don't want this project to look like something that was designed in a vacuum and just happens to be occupying this land, that it should be an outgrowth of it and reflect both the physical and cultural history there. In previous developments, Google has emphasized its commitment to quality and innovation in workplace design and sustainability. And then legally, obviously, the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA, includes historical resources, building structures, or archaeological resources as part of the environment, making them subject to review as part of any proposal's environmental impact analysis. At this point, I'll thank both Matthew and Lori for uh, sharing some of the GIS data that they had uh, put together. Local historic resources. The Deerdown Station area includes 34 properties listed on the City of San Jose Historic Resources. Now that being said, there is a variety of levels of protection, and that was one thing that I wanted to cover to show that this isn't a simple topic. There are multiple different aspects to consider. So here in the background with a, a 1920s, 1930s rendering of the San Jose Water Company, which is very close to the affected area, we see obviously the National Register on the highest level, uh, the California Register of Historic Places, and then within the city, there's a number of different levels. There's the historic districts and conservation areas. There are the individual city landmarks. There's the historic resources inventory, which include what they call contributing structures, structures of merit, etc. And then there's the heritage trees. And I will say at the same time, none of what I'm necessarily presenting is comprehensive, as someone like Brian Grayson from PAC SJ could probably point out the errors I'll make through here, so <laughs> bear with me. National and California registers. Within the area, the, perhaps the most prominent, obviously, is Deerdown Station itself, which is on the National Register. And the National Register actually has a fascinating amount of information. I found pictures from the 40s through today, lots of documentation on it, in fact, when it was the uh, what, Southern Pacific Depot. Uh, Foreman's Arena is National Register eligible. Uh, the eligible often uh, triggers additional review when a proposed project comes forward, but it does not guarantee protection in any way, shape, or form. It is essentially another level of consideration. And this data was actually uh, created when the original Deerdon Station Area Plan was done, so the KNTV building was included that obviously, as we know, was destroyed by fire in 2014. Here's an example of something that was California Register eligible that was not protected and then unfortunately, through unfortunate events, was destroyed. City historic and landmark districts. Both within the Deerdown Station area and immediately adjacent to it, there are a number. There's the Alameda City Landmark District, which is the right of way itself. Uh, the River Street City Landmark District, what most of us now know as Little Italy, which is actually a city landmark district. So both the district and the individual buildings within it have substantial protection. The Lake House City Landmark District, again, immediately adjacent to the conversations we're having here. Uh, and among others, the something near and dear to my heart, the Hanchette and Hester Park Conservation Area, which again just triggers an additional review within the city, but doesn't actually afford formal protection. Ooh, too far. City historic landmarks, the San Jose Water Company and the Dennis Residence are the two landmarks within the area or immediately adjacent to the area to consider. One well, of the main things I wanted to mention was underprotected cultural resources, which kind of is one of the reasons we're all here. The resources, whether it's built, whether it's culture, whether it's history, that without some awareness could get destroyed or could get left behind. We've had conversations about, obviously, the Stevens Meets sign, which has no f protections whatsoever. It, it is all contingent upon the ownership of the land that it's on. And 
Google and PackSJ hopefully coming to an agreement regarding said. Uh, Babe's Muffler, Babe is a landmark, but that being said, being on the edge of the Deardon Station area and being within the Alameda Urban Village Plan, it will only be a matter of time before there is a submittal to remove or relocate him, taking him out of his context and potentially reducing or eliminating his landmark status. And a few other items that I think our work here can help inform is Poor House Bistro, Patty's Inn, and the Harold Hellwer Hellwig Ironwork. And then to finish, project immediately adjacent to all of this, the San Jose Water Company. This is a Trammell Crow pr project that was approved under some previous entitlements, which is, I believe, a million square feet of office and a number of residential units, which there are some lessons to be learned. We discussed it in the parks. We discussed it in land use and design. This is the level, we're this is one-ninth of the proposed office space that Google might need in a development that spans two city blocks. So this shows us the scope of some of what we're dealing with and an opportunity here. You can see the creek daylighted. You can see the water company. Additional sources of information. PACSJ, as I mentioned, is a fantastic resource. The great 408 that Sal Pizarro and others have pushed is a great source of information for things about San Jose that should be preserved and incorporated. The mid-century context statement, looking at buildings from the mid-century that now should be considered historic as we move forward. And thankfully, now the city has a grant. They are undertaking a historic survey strategy for the first time in, I think it's 15 years now, they are doing a comprehensive survey of the downtown area for buildings that may not have been historic resources before but should be considered so potentially now. Thank you very much, Edward. So I forgot to mention that we're going to do a discussion after each group. Uh, we'll take about five or ten minutes after each group grows, and we can discuss what has been presented by that group. So next up is Teresa. Okay, so on the slide you see a bunch of information about SPUR, so I'm not going to repeat it. But I will say that we are a city's first organization, and we have uh, offices in San Francisco, San Jose, and Oakland. That city's first approach informs our regional work, and that in turn informs our state level advocacy work. The foundation of our work is urban policy research and expertise. The, this report is the first one that we did when we opened our San Jose office. It's called Getting to Great Places. And it identified the impediments and made recommendations for creating walkable and bikeable people first urban places in San Jose. The second report that we published uh, in support of our San Jose work was called The Future of Downtown San Jose, and that was in 2014. We believe that a great city begins in its downtown. It's usually the place with the greatest density, uh, and downtown really sets the tone for a city and is the primary public expression of its identity. So you can find both of those reports on our website. And we really believe that since planning affects, oops, I don't know what happened there, somehow. There we go. Since planning affects everyone, uh, that everyone should be involved in planning. We were early promoters of community engagement in planning. This was our brochure in 1947. It says, this is your city, help shape it. So, and we have lots of convenings and engagement events. You can check our website for the schedule, which is listed there. We've also been a leading voice uh, on the, in the transformation of Deer Dawn, San Jose Central Station. You heard at a previous meeting about the study tour to Europe that we organized last summer that has helped to inform the thinking about the station and is having a lasting impact on how the partner agencies are collaborating. We strongly believe that the rail operations must be planned first and planned perfectly with seamlessly integrated service and access that puts the customer first. If we are to get people out of their cars and onto transit, we must compete on speed, convenience, cost, safety, and comfort. And transit is a major catalyst for the transformation of downtown. And a core but underappreciated asset in San Jose is our river park. We've launched an effort to re-envision the Guadalupe River Park to create a central green space for the community to come together, create a center focal point to the city, connect downtown with surrounding neighborhoods, and improve the natural resource system. We're actively partnering with the City of San Jose, the Guadalupe River Park Conservancy, and the Santa Clara Valley Water District. On August 1st, we're gonna host Scott Kratz of the 11th Street Bridge Park in Washington, D.C., who will be here to talk about, among other things, 
their equitable development plan to ensure that the park that they're creating is a driver for inclusive development and provides opportunities for all residents, regardless of income and de demography. If you're interested in learning more and being a part of that, please send an email to the uh, grp at spur.org. Finally, this article from The Atlantic um, last year really speaks to me. It says, the place where the poor once thrived. Um, I was born and raised on the east side. My parents divorced when I was four, and my mom was on welfare for a time, raising five kids. But I had access to great schools. My family members owned homes. When I graduated from high school, I worked at Atari and Rome and NASA Ames Research Center. That's what I want to make possible for the next generation, and that's really what drives me. Um, housing and developing the educational pipeline to economic opportunities are key to recreating the inclusive economy that San Jose once embodied. The housing problem. Um, in a May 18th article in the Star, Enrico Moretti, Enrico Moretti, an economics professor at UC Berkeley, talked about technology hubs, hub cities, saying, quote, these cities have a very good problem in terms of employment and wages, unquote, citing that each new job, tech job creates four to five non-tech jobs over the next decade. Roughly 40% of the non-tech work is for professionals like lawyers, doctors, and architects, and the remaining 60% are non-professional. Quote, the labor market is a tide that lifts most boats with one big issue, the cost of living. So that's because while there are more jobs across the spectrum and generally rising wages, the housing supply doesn't keep up. He said that Tech City should accommodate as many housing units as possible, especially with transit. So we need to keep that in mind as we think about the broader 240 acres in the Deridon Station area. And secondly, the educational and economic pipeline. We have a target, the opening of Google's offices in San Jose, if it happens. Let's collaborate on making sure that we have a pipeline for any of the direct and indirect jobs that are created by this project and provide our residents with the opportunities of their dreams. Then we will earn our name as the richest city in the country. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. That was perfectly timed. All right. That's why I wrote it all down. <laughs> Nicole is next. Hello, everyone. My name, is My name is Nicole Brown, and I'm with The Lost on the Alameda. Um, after um, Google's last presentation, um, I decided to change my presentation because they really did address all of the um, ideas in which the stakeholders on the Alameda had, which was equity in design, making sure that you know there was accessibility and, and that Google wouldn't just be an office building, but it would have mixed use and be a 24 hours um, kind of area. So. I was looking for topics, and one thing that I think is underrepresented on this community board is young people. Um, I am a person in my 20s, and I think that's rare to be on this board. People in their 20s have spoken and give, gave in public comment. They've paraded and protested here, but I think that <coughs> we don't really understand how young people are struggling here in the Bay Area. Um, so my, my topic is economics of housing. Um, economics is defined as the branch of knowledge concerned with the production, consumption, and transfer of wealth. Many agree that production, consumption, use ownership in this case, and transfer of wealth has much to do with housing. Housing is usually the greatest asset that a parent can pass on to their progeny. And it's hard to believe that up until the 1970s, home builders in the Bay Area were turning out homes for 30 or 40 K each which was at a similar price point as the rest of the country. But where are we now? 41.5% <clears throat> of San Jose's renters are rent burdened. And this is a study by NYU. This is not rent uncomfortable. This is rent burden. And this is half of San Jose's renters. And by rent burden, this means people buy less groceries so that they can make rent. <clears throat> and to buy that median price $1 million home, you need an annual income of over $200,000 annually. And just keep in mind, the median average income of San Jose's residents is in the low 100,000s. So who can even afford to buy? Only the top earners. And people are surprised to hear 
of young people sleeping in their cars. I'm going to be frank, that is the new reality for young people in the Bay Area. Um, when I was a full-time intern, even working full-time as an intern and working five hours a night as with rideshare, I still couldn't find an affordable room here. Um, there were times when, after working a 13-hour day, I was too tired to drive to San Francisco to sleep on my friend's couch, so I slept in my car. This is a crisis. That's true. And serve the people of San Jose have a point. But who is responsible? It is the city, not Google. This is the city's responsibility. The city's function and responsibility is to promote the general welfare of its community, and it has been failing us. For too long, San Jose has been saying, yes, housing is a problem, but what are our neighbors to the north doing? Instead of looking at the issue head on and taking action. The thing is, San Jose really is a leader. The two small neighboring cities I have worked for that are close to San Jose have always looked to San Jose to chart the course. So when San Jose is saying, it's more the other guy's fault, the cities around the region will follow suit. But in fairness, San Jose is coming along. In fact, this past month, City Council finally passed an affordable housing-focused budget. But until the pendulum starts to swing back to the people, there's going to be protesting, and rightfully so. You know, Google can board afford, build affordable housing, and I think they should, but it will be a drop in the much-needed bucket. It is only the city who can make sure housing is built at all ranges for the community, not just market rate housing, because as I have already illustrated my possession, in my presentation, market rate is out of reach for the majority. The city needs to start asking questions. Instead of what the market can bear, it needs to ask what developers can bear. How many affordable units can a project bear? How many rent-controlled low-income units can a development bear? And residents need to start saying yes in my backyard and find a way to support new development. We all need to do more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicole. Uh, next up is Charlie, and he's going to take it from the stage. Very well done, Nicole. Nice job. Uh, my name is Charlie Foss. I'm the Vice President for Admin and Finance at San Jose State University. And so, uh, show of hands, who went to San Jose State University? Who in their family went to San Jose State, has a family member that went to San Jose State University? San Jose State University is our university. It's the, it's Silicon Valley's university. You know, we are graduating, we just graduated last month, 10,000 students. Uh, for the first time, uh, and I'm not sure why this wasn't done before, but we have a new president and we're doing new things now. Uh, every graduate walked across the stage and we did, uh, we moved our graduations over to Avaya for the most part. And they walked across the stage, had their hand shaken by the president, the provost, had their picture up, had their name pronounced appropriately uh, as they walked and got their diploma. They were recognized. The university is now trying to take steps to be a really, uh, continuing to take uh, steps to be a good community partner. You know, you saw back about 15 or so years ago, um, the university took a big step with Susan Hammer, uh, President Corrette at the time, where <clears throat> we uh, partnered on the library. And so we have the MLK Library across the street here, uh, gorgeous big library uh, that's better than the city could have built or the university, we joined together and put that. <clears throat> Recently, about two years ago, we partnered on the Hammer Theater and reopened the Hammer Theater uh, to provide uh, a whole diverse bit of population for arts in our community and really serving uh, the needs of uh, not just the university, but the community uh, at large. We have about 34,000 students. We are the largest land holder in the, in the city of San Jose, in the downtown area. We are the largest employer in the downtown area. We have 160 acres of land in downtown San Jose. We have, you know, besides the 34,000 students, we have 5,000 faculty and staff. Uh, so when we're talking about things going on in the downtown, you know, every day, or at least Monday through Thursdays, uh, when we're teaching, uh, 40,000 people are on our campus. And lots of you 
uh, cut through our campus on a regular basis, and you're welcome on our, on our campus anytime. To walk your dogs, please on a leash, uh, but <clears throat> you know, be part of our campus. Be part of our activities. We're going to do a better job of putting calendars out so you can see our activities that we have going on. Uh, a couple other points uh, that I want to you know, talk about. Uh, <clears throat> we've built a lot of new facilities in the past couple years for students. Come on our campus, enjoy a lunch at our student union. We have lots of you know, Panda Express and Taco Bell and uh, you know, Steak and Shake uh, you know, on our campus uh, that you're, anybody is welcome to. City Hall folks come over all the time. Uh, we uh, have a new state-of-the-art science building. We just got approved today. Uh, that's going to be built uh, starting, we break ground next summer. Eight-story building uh, just off of um, San Carlos and uh, 4th Street. Uh, it's going to be state-of-the-art, uh, gorgeous, uh, you know, uh, building that's going up there. Uh, this uh, coming January, uh, we're opening up our new uh, rec and aquatic center. Uh, that's going to be where the old pools were. A lot of people know where the old pools were. Uh, this is going to be a state-of-the-art, sticky building where we're going to get people, our students, to stay on campus longer. Rather than just going to classes, they can uh, work out, they can go to our student union, go to the library. So it gives more uh, stickiness to our campus. But the other things that we're concerned about, you know, that uh, Nicole was bringing up, it's housing. You know, we, we have massive problems with our students. We have 4,000 beds on our campus. That's not enough. Our faculty and staff are making way less than uh, the numbers that Nicole was sharing uh, to afford. Uh, and so we're faced with the same struggles uh, that a lot of the downtown residents are facing and that we're talking about here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlie. Uh, we're going to wrap up this group with Jonathan. All right, well, I'm not going to read that. I'll let you guys read that. I've been quietly listening to everybody on this advisory group and some of the people in the audience and just taking note of some of the things that have been said. Um, my presentation is obviously on gentrification, but some of the things that I've heard here have really bothered me quite a bit. Um, I've heard quite a few times, not only by people sitting here on this advisory group, but some of the people behind me, that gentrification is going to displace people of color and people of our minorities or Hispanics. Um, quite frankly, to suggest or imply yeah. that because of my skin color or my heritage that I'm going to be displaced, I find that racist. I do. And I find that insulting. I'm doing just fine. I'm Native American and Hispanic. And I've got a lot of people in my neighborhood that's quite diverse. People of color, minorities, and Hispanics. So I don't want to hear gentrification is going to change my neighborhood. If, it is, if anything, it's doing just what it's supposed to do. It's the most diverse neighborhood in the entire city. And so I'm really upset by that. There was a study done and published um, by UC Berkeley and UCLA in 2015. Um, and it actually mentioned the Deridon area as a an area that's going through gentrification. In this, it concluded and listen carefully. It benefited educated blacks and Hispanics most. Benefited most. So really want you to understand that this is my neighborhood. I live there. I'm close. I'm ground zero. I know what's going on in my neighborhood. So um, we'll do that. There was a couple other things that have been mentioned. Um, we still have a long ways to go with with the neighborhood. There's still quite a lot of blight that needs to be taken care of. When I first moved into Georgetown, you know, there were hookers in front of the Flamingo and there was drug deals going down at Motel 6. And NBC 11 studio burned down. I mean, it was, it, it's been a challenge. And, you know, Georgetown has been part of the gentrification and I am the face of gentrification. And it's not a bad thing, as you just read. Um, you know, we still have a long ways to go. Um, there's, there's some new development going down on San Carlos. Of course, with this Google project, it's going to change the other side of, of the, the tracks just as, as, as well. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I've been in this neighborhood for 25 years, so I know it well. Um, we have lots of low-income housing. I'll let you just read that. And we've been talking about housing here with the people sitting next to me. And, and it's, I, we've heard it many times throughout here, but we're OK. We've got a lot of low-income housing, but what we really do need is more housing for people like me. 
I'm not rich. I, I'm upper middle class at best. And we need more housing for people like that. Right now, we have a housing project going in, and we have an SR coming, SRO coming in that's a single room occupancy. So we've got projects going in for low-income housing. What we need is more housing for us. Somebody also mentioned that parks, we don't have enough parks in this area. Well, I think some of you people who went on the parks neighbor uh, tour know that that. And this is only within a half mile of this development, and I'll let you just read that. There's lots. Um, economics. My degree is in economics. I have a master's degree in economics. And you can read that and, and, and go with it. But the, the bottom line here is that there's a lack of supply. And there's demand. It's pretty simple. But what creates that? We're the 10th largest city in the United States, the third largest city in California, number one largest city in the Bay Area, the sixth safest in America, and the wealthiest city in the United States. It all comes down to supply and demand. So my suggestions are go higher on all along the transit lines. If you think six stories is high, you're wrong. It needs to go double that. Sadly to say, I was on the Shipna board when we were fighting the Ohlone project as being too high. I regret that now. It should have been twice as high. So supply, you have to build it. And these are some of the areas I think that would really benefit housing. Now, yeah, you might get displaced out of the Georgetown area or the, you know, the Duradon Station area. But Build it high so it gives incentives for people to build more units and affordable pieces within it. So if you can get a Barry Swenson to go up 20 stories, he might designate 10% of that as low income. So in conclusion, you can go ahead and, and read this, but I, I think we need to embrace what's going to happen here. It's already happening. You can't stop it. It's, it's organic. So make the best of it. Thank you very much, Jonathan. So with that, we're now going to open it up to discussion with, uh, with the overall SOG. And I'm going to remind you, if you could please flip your nameplates vertically, uh, and I can call on you, that would be great. And if you have any questions for the group, let's first start off by giving everyone a big hand. That was fantastic. OK, any questions, comments? Wow, all right, it was that convincing. Excellent. I think you all are done. And if you want to take your, if the next group could bring your, oh, we do have one. We do have one. Reginald, you're up. If you could please state your name. Uh, Reginald Swilly, Minority Business Consortium. Uh, I'm concerned about uh, the, the uh, Jonathan, you, and uh, Brown, with Nicole. You, you gave us two different looks at what we're dealing with here. We are challenged. Uh, uh, we know how gentrification and, and, and all the issues that's happening with housing is happening in cities all around the country. And, and I'm sorry I missed our last meeting. But I think the challenge around this table is for us to come up with a way that people that work in this college professors, people working on San Jose State, they can't get a college professor to come and teach here because they are telling them you got to have somebody you can live with. That's a ridiculous statement for a city of, for a, 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 a state university like San Jose State. We have got to figure out how to make housing a real thing, and, and young people are not living in their cars. And yes, uh, 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 our economy. And the, and, and the organic thing that's happening in America is richer people are moving into city centers and poorer people are moving far away from city centers. And somebody said that the city center, center is a lot more important. There's a lot more hollowed ground. And therefore, this is happening. We have got to come up with a way to change that. We cannot, I mean, I don't want to be part of a system that's going to allow people to be continually sleeping on the streets and young people sleeping in cars when they have full-time jobs and professors at San Jose State that can't live in the town, they can't live across the street from where they work because it's too rich. <coughs> I'm sitting here because I think we are up for the challenge and I hope we are. I like the idea of building 20 stores if we can. Let's move this city to build 20 stores. I agree with that because we need more housing than we have, 
and finding the sweet spot for the developer is not beyond us. We can find a sweet spot for the developer and then have somewhere for people to live. My children don't live in San Jose, right? And they're all college educated. So we, let's take this challenge. Let's don't just bury our head in the sand. Because 40 years from now, 50 years from now, the work that we do here could change the country. Right? And that's why I, I sat here, because I said, let's take this challenge on. I think we should be able to do it. I just needed to say that after Nicole and your last uh, 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 presentation. Thank you very much, Reginald. It looks like we have one yeah. more from Jeffrey here, and then we'll go ahead and move on. Appreciated the, the presentation. It's just um, Name and um, organization. Jeffrey Buchanan with uh, Working Partnerships USA. Um, just a, a couple of things. Um, uh, Jonathan, uh, to your point, I appreciate the presentation, uh, but I think it's just important to note while there, there may be a, a within your neighborhood a number of uh, uh, affordable housing developments as a city, we continue to not meet our goals. Uh, the fact that we've only met 7% of our affordable housing production goals uh, as a city while we've well exceeded our market rate housing goals under the, the RENA process, um, I think it speaks a lot about the, the limitations of uh, just building higher without a focus on affordability. Uh, and, and similarly, uh, I would also just push back, and I don't have this really in my presentation, I'm wishing I would have, uh, spent this morning uh, working on a, an analysis, of, you know, what has the uh, rise of the tech economy been f like for different parts of the uh, economic uh, strata here in the city of San Jose? Um, to your point, Teresa, uh, Certainly, uh, you know, Dr. Moretti's research shows the kind of job creation that comes from tax growth. Uh, but when it comes to wages, I don't think we can say that wage gro growth has been evenly shared, particularly for low wage workers. And I don't think we can really even say that tech growth has been a, a particular driver of uh, high quality jobs and increasing wages. I think we've seen here as tech has grown in San Jose, uh, the fastest growing segments of our job market are low wage jobs and actually the distribution of jobs over the last uh, 15 years, uh, well 20 years, uh, looks to be that low wage jobs are actually taking up a greater proportion of our overall job market than uh, medium or, uh, well they're growing at a larger pace I should say than, than the medium or high wage jobs. Uh, it's something like 10% uh, more low wage jobs than in 1995 even uh, with a, a slowing down of the other two segments. And the result, you know, you have for service workers and for blue collar workers, after you figure in the rising cost of rents, their incomes have gone down by 20%. 20% uh, for service workers, 25% for blue collar workers. Um, so I don't think we can say that the, the, the tech growth has led to wage growth or that it's been broadly shared. Uh, I think we really got to dig in at what that looks like as, as this committee considers how we, how we work together around this project. Thank you, Jeffrey. And Harvey wanted to make a comment here. Name and organization, please, Harvey. So thank you all. You did very well. Uh, I want to talk about two issues, uh, Jonathan and Nicole. Oh, Harvey Darnell, North Willow Neighborhood Association, and someone who's been doing this Deer Don area for well over a decade. Um, one of the issues that Jonathan mentioned, tall buildings. Well, one of the issues that we have is the OEI, one engine inoperative, that limits the area to about 10 stories. So the question I have for staff is, can you come back to us to tell us what kinds of negotiations are going on with the uh, airport and the FAA to help us uh, in this area because Google would love to build taller buildings in my discussions with them. They would like that and that would open up um, not only more housing opportunities and mixed use opportunities but also keep us from having a footprint where it's just nothing but solid buildings and no open space. So that's first thing. Second thing is I've been dealing with low-income housing forever. I'm not forever, but since 2001. And what I have discovered is that there are very few builders and developers that are willing to do mixed income housing, that are willing to do even a preponderance of market rate housing and create anything more than 
affordable housing, which is affordable housing in this valley is you have to have an income of, um, of um, $120,000 a year. What we need is VLI, very low income, extremely low income, ELI, and LI, low income. And I've forgotten what the exact numbers are, but they're in the 30, 40, 50, 60 thousand dollar range, which are all the support workers for all these things that are coming along. Nobody has wanted, and I've, I've been to multiple um, uh, developments, for example, VTA is developing over by Tamian Station, and they are doing an, a, a market rate, and they're doing something that is more affordable and includes some, I think, ELI and VLI, but they would not consider it together. I think that is discriminatory. I think that we should find a way to find some partners who are willing to mix everybody together so that we don't have areas that are clearly marked, you are a low-income person, you are less than, you are less than um, uh, a community member. Um, Harvey, if I could ask you to wrap yeah. up, sorry. So, we so anyway, I'd like to see if we can make some, some comments into the uh, staff as they're writing a report that we do that. Sure. Yeah, do you, want, do you guys want to respond? Yes, go ahead. Um, I, would, I would like to um, state that I respectfully dis disagree on the comment that um, developers don't like to add in affordable units. Um, factually, my experience working within the planning department of the city of Campbell, developers clamored to add in affordable units in order to get a density bonus. Yeah, I... I only had four minutes to do my presentation. Otherwise, I would have addressed a lot of that stuff, Harvey. Um, yeah. This is just like any other pockets of San Jose. You've got very nice neighborhoods. Willow Glen, very expensive place to live. Rose Garden, Silver Creek, Almaden Valley. I mean, those are highly sought after places to live. Um, my vision of this area is it's going to be in the same neighborhood or same realm of that is that this area is going to be just like that very desirable place to live with that comes an increase in price of homes i wish i could live in your neighborhood that's a really nice neighborhood willow Glen is very nice but i can't afford it so i live where i can and so what i'm suggesting is is that not everybody's going to be able to live in this area once it gets developed and gentrified that you know it's going to happen so what you do is you start looking towards the east where there's more land more a, you're more able to go up higher because there's no in one engine out problem. So places like Eastridge, you could build really tall buildings over there. The, you know, the Barry S. flea market area, you know, start building them there. And that gives people like Barry Swenson a chance to add more affordable housing to that. And that's what you do, it's supply and demand. Um, and in, in terms of, of Jeffrey's comments, um, I, I, I know you do your research. Uh, I would highly recommend you look at that, uh, that study by UC Berkeley and UCLA. Um, you can Google it or bang it if you don't like Google. We, we were um, a co-author so, of that paper, but yeah. And so, um, <laughs> you know, it talks about everything that you addressed. And some of it is kind of old because now we're at the point where we're almost at full unemployment. Okay. Thank you all very much. I'm going to ask thank you again. I'm going to ask the next group here, Nadia, John, Harvey, Jeffrey, and Kevin to come up. And if you can bring your nameplates with you, that would be super helpful. Uh, and in this next round, when we're coming to comments, if we could actually make it more questions to the panel versus just general comments, that would be super helpful so we can get through this evening on time. I appreciate it. We're going to start with Nadia. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nadia. I'm with the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. And 
I supervise the housing program. And for those of you not familiar with the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley, we provide free legal services. We're the largest provider of free legal services in Santa Clara County, and we do it in three areas, housing, health, and kids. Um, so I'm going to talk about a familiar topic to all of you, gentrification and displacement. Um, gentrification has been defined today, but I'll define it again. Um, it's a process of neighborhood change that includes economic change when higher income residents move in um, and a demographic change where um, it usually ends up with people being less, with the community being less diverse unless there are um, interventions that allow for what we call equitable revitalization, where we revitalize a community um, without displacement. And displacement occurs uh, when a household is forced to move from its residence not voluntarily, so because of rising rents or because of evictions. And for the past few years at the Law Foundation, we've seen a huge rise in displacement. We've seen a rise in the number of evictions that are happening. We're, we've seen entire buildings being displaced, entire mobile home parks um, being displaced, people being forced out. That's just the reality of what we're seeing. Um, and displacement is not a good thing. It's more than just people being forced to move out. There are serious consequences to a community from displacement. Um, there's studies that show health are affected, health is affected. There's studies that show every time a kid moves, their educational achievement actually drops. Um, um, there's a famous book, Evicted. I'm sure many of you have seen it. If you haven't read it, you should, you should read it. Um, I always say I, I haven't read it, but it's basically my life. Um, evictions cause job loss, stress. There's, there's so many negative consequences for to, uh, from eviction. Um, this is a slide from um, the UC Berkeley study that's been mentioned here before that talks about um, San Jose being in advanced stages, a lot of San Jose either being in advanced stages of displacement or actually experiencing uh, gentrification. This is uh, data from the Law Foundation itself. This is who we're seeing on a daily basis. Um, we started asking people who uh, are facing eviction what, about themselves, and we get to 200 to 300 calls a month about people facing, from people facing eviction. 50% um, have lived in this community for 31 years or longer. 40% we are, are severely rent burdened, which means they spend close to 70% of their income on rent. Another 40% spend close to 50% of their income on rent. Over 50% of the people facing displacement are Latino. Um, and we started asking people about whether they feel worried, tense, or sad more than 14 days in the last 30 days. This is a public health statistic that's used to kind of um, gauge mental health in communities either who don't have access to mental health services or who have stigma around mental health. Um, and it shows that 77, and when we asked this question, 77% of the people who responded um, have said that yes, they are, they felt that way in the last 14 days or, or more. So this is what displacement really does to a community. Imagine being here for 31 years and then um, trying to find another place to live. It's 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 really difficult. Um, other communities have done things when um, massive development has come in to try to mitigate displacement. Um, an affordable housing fund, Facebook, um, when with their expansion set up an affordable housing fund. Um, there's a pr sometimes communities get a community benefits agreement where there's a set aside for a certain percentage of housing built as affordable, um, funding nonprofit legal services. Facebook did this with their expansion, um, supporting anti-displacement policies. This was also part of the Facebook expansion in the Brook Brooklyn Basin, which is in Oakland, where they affirmatively said that they would support the city's or community's anti-displacement policies, and then welcoming businesses that agree to avoid displacing the community. Thank, yes. thank you very much, Nadia. Sorry. How do I turn this thing off? Perfect timing. Next up, we have John. Yeah. So I'm not really, OK. Uh, there is a video thing. I'm not sure how to do it. But um, I grew up on the ocean, and so I was always been interested in waves and how waves kind of hit the shore and what makes a wave big. And so you have energy uh, that initiates a wave uh, deep in the ocean. And it moves, as the energy moves towards the shore, uh, the waves are created because the landscape underneath the water is rising. So Mavericks, which is close to my house, is, uh, <clears throat> is a, because there's a giant 
uh, cliff that, that rises up out of the ocean and the waves just get very high there. Uh, San Jose is kind of like that bowl of, of water or a giant basin of water that the, the waves hit the margins quite strong. East side San Jose is literally on the margin of San Jose. It is home to people from Mexico, Vietnam, the Philippines, India, and dozens of other countries. And the east side is one of San Jose's most vibrant and diverse communities, and it is also home to the region's most affordable housing stock. Most of the people in East San Jose uh, community are not, by and large, the CEOs, the CFOs, or anyone with a uh, three-letter acronym or a six-figure salary. They are the tech industry adjacent workers. They are janitors, gardeners, hospitality workers for tech companies. They are also teachers, social service and construction workers, and many work in the hospitality and food service, the essential workers that make Silicon Valley work. They're real people. Ruby lives uh, and works in the cafeteria at Facebook. Um, Fernando and Jaime live by St. Maria Goretti Parish. Uh, their brothers who work in construction and nearby Daisy and Ruben are raising their children who are excellent students and they hope that one day their kids will work in tech companies and Daisy and um, uh, and uh, Ruben will uh, that work Daisy and Ruben clean the offices in, in the evening the Mayfair community is the heart of the east side and is the most affordable area in San Jose in 2016 the medium fair market value of a home is four hundred uh, four hundred thousand fifty nine dollars uh, in 2017, it rose to 544,000. In 2018, we expect an even steeper increase. The estimated household medium income is 53,000. Keep in mind that income is a combination of several people working in multiple jobs for those who live on the east side. People will not be able to keep up with the rising rent and house of co uh, the rising rent and cost of housing. Some will inevitably move away, but most will triple and quadruple up in a home or apartment. Others will live in vehicles or a friend's couch or on the streets. When a large infusion of wealth and infrastructure drops into the, the, the very shallow basin of San Jose, it will inevitably send ripples toward the margins. We must consider the economic and human impact on these margins. The ripples of displacement look like losing your home or apartment and not having regular place to take a bath and not having a regular access to a bathroom. The ripple means displaced people will be living in a situation where there isn't adequate food storage or a place to prepare food. The ripple will affect basic access to shelter, healthy nutrition, mental and emotional well-being, sanitation, and public health. As faith leaders, we work with these communities, and we feel the ripple of the economic and housing displacement every day. We know that something has to change. Our response to these cha challenges is motiv motivated by both faith and reason. Faith connects us to one another. Faith. Uh, tells us that we are fundamentally brother and sister, and what happens to one affects all of us. Faith shows us also what's possible. We are, motiv motiv we are also, therefore, motivated by reason. Reason looks at facts. It considers evidence and data. We believe that through reason we can examine the human cost of what tech expansion and construction of a transportation hub might have on our community on the east side. Reason does not make us fear the future. Rather, it allows us to logically and systemically critique, reshape, and form public policy that ensures that those who live on the rim and margin will not only be protected from the ripples of expansion and development, but that we will be able to share in the prosperity. In addition to hiking and biking trails, jobs and economic support, we need affordable housing and anti-displacement policies and robust protections for existing neighborhoods to preserve the character and the culture of the people already living there. Therefore, we call for an independent study to be conducted on how development of the station area will affect economic fragile communities on the east side. Thank you very much, John. And John, we'll make sure that that link is active when it's posted to the website so the video works. Thank you. Next up is Harvey. I'm Harvey Darnell, North Wilgun Neighborhood Association and former chair of the Greater Garden of Knack and uh, was instrumental in working with the city in beginning the Los Gatos Creek Trail um, on uh, south of uh, Lincoln Avenue, or north of Lincoln Avenue, excuse me, north and west of, uh, east of Lincoln Avenue. The first slide shows you the 
Uh, I can't get the uh, pointer to work. Well, in the pink area is the area that we're talking about. Um, <clears throat> the blue line below it is the trail that uh, I worked on and when I was chair and co vice chair, and Kevin also was chair of the Greater Gardner uh, uh, Coalition. And we have a bridge across uh, the Los Gatos Creek into North Willow Glen and Gregory Plaza. Um, the Three Creeks Trail is shown down there and will, once we get the bridge uh, resolved, will tie right into this trail. And you can see the outer uh, line is a three mile radius. So actually you're going uh, within three miles of uh, almost to Campbell. Yep. Yeah, th this is, uh, <laughs> uh, come on. This is a photo of 1968. You can see that in 1968, that um, the um, uh, Bird Avenue was directly uh, uh, plugged into Montgomery. Autumn did not come down much south of, uh, it was a substreet south of San Fernando. And on the left is a Shell Oil uh, map from 1951 uh, that shows that. Um, but you can see it was a continuous creek and it was, it was open to the uh, uh, daylight. Now, in 19, somewhere between 1968 and 1972, the city widened Bird Avenue to six lanes, uh, plugged it into uh, Montgomery in a wider way, uh, making Montgomery one uh, way south, and extended Autumn down uh, and making it the north uh, entrance uh, to the uh, Santa Clara uh, area. Oh, and then, and then more importantly, what they did is they built a culvert and, and um, closed up the creek. And you can see this is a, a possibility of, of one of the possibilities of what's called daylight in the creek, basically opening it up, building a channel adjacent to the culverts that have been... Uh, um, in there for, for over 50 years. This is one of the two culverts. It's two large culverts that, this is the dry side that doesn't have water most of the year except in the very, very wet, rainy seasons. And you can see that it is a place that uh, is less than desirable. It's certainly not something you would want to go walking down into right now. This is what could be created. There is salmon spawning in Los Gatos Creek. These are photos that uh, were created by Steve Holmes. And by the way, the deck that I'm showing you was mostly created by Larry Ames, who would be quite willing to, for any of you who want to go and see all this and see what the possibilities are like, um, he'll be willing to do it. And I think that, come on. So in summary, we're hoping that out of this project that we can get the daylighting of Los Gatos Creek and create a continuous biking trail which would take us all the way down to SAP Center. And this is one of the alternatives. So. Thank you very much, Harvey. Uh, next up is Jeffrey. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Jeffrey Buchanan. I'm the policy director with Working Partnerships USA. Uh, we're a community-based organization. Uh, with a base of about 65,000 uh, organized voters in Santa Clara County, uh, primarily working families and communities of color. Uh, we're also a co-founder of Silicon Valley Rising, which is a community and labor coalition to build a tech economy that works for everyone. Uh, since last year, uh, some of you have probably heard me talk about uh, the process uh, that Silicon Valley Rising and, and a number of folks here around the table have, have been taking part in and leading uh, doing town halls, doing a large community survey, through that, we've engaged about 1,500, 1,600 residents across the city to build a vision uh, for what we think uh, should come from this Google Dearden project and released a report envisioning community 
Um, my colleague, uh, Marina Well Fernandez, she's gone this week, but we'll uh, do a presentation on it next week. So rather than content, I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about a, a way of thinking about our role uh, here as the SOG. Uh, and want to talk about one thing that I hope we can all leave here with. There's been a lot of questions about what our role is, what we could expect of Google, what we could ask of Google, what's really realistic. And I think the one thing I really want to leave you with with this presentation is that, yes, San Jose, uh, we're worth it. Uh, yes, San Jose, uh, we're worth it. Um, Google isn't the only one that's bringing something valuable uh, to this potential project. Uh, the people of San Jose are offering a whole lot. Uh, public decisions, public lands, coming investments worth millions if not billions to Google, uh, including the selling of some of our most valuable public land. Uh, the dozen or so acres of public land that are part of this exclusive negotiating agreement are some of the most prime opportune land for transit-oriented development in the entire Bay Area. Uh, First and foremost, because of the $10 billion in taxpayer-funded investments that are going to go into improving our, uh, bring BART down to San Jose, electrifying Caltrain, redesigning the station infrastructure, and completing high-speed rail. Uh, and, and thirdly, as, as Harvey alluded to earlier, uh, Google still needs the public to approve massive upzoning to make this project possible. Uh, to accommodate an 8 million square foot mixed-use facility in a, a project footprint around 40 acres, uh, Google's going to need to build nearly twice as high as currently allowed in the DSAP. Uh, and nearly double the amount of office space envisioned in Dearden Station when the DSAP plan was first developed. Uh, and Google's going to need San Jose's residents to approve specific and general planning amendments, to rezone areas and parcels, zoned for quasi-public and public uses that you could build affordable housing on, but you can't build an 8 million square foot mixed-use commercial project on. All these things are going to require we as residents of San Jose to support this project before it can happen. Google needs the people of San Jose to deliver on these investments and approvals, which will be worth millions and millions of dollars to Google. It's going to increase the value of both the, the public lands they're hoping to buy and the private lands they've already purchased. And there's no public policy tools to really ensure that our community, and not just Google, captures the benefits of all these decisions and investments and supports. A fair market price alone for the public land isn't going to capture that value. Thankfully, there is a way that the city of San Jose can look at capturing the value of these things and then also dealing with the impacts negatively when you think about inequality, when you think about displacement, all the things we've been talking about. Uh, there's a vehicle to really capture both of those things in a fair way. Uh, and that's a community benefits agreement. Uh, my time's running short, but I run through a kind of a series of different projects. The Staples Center in Los Angeles, uh, the Oakland Army Base uh, up north from here uh, that involve different types of public benefits around uh, investments in affordable housing, uh, job standards, investments in other kinds of community infrastructure, all these things with a legal way, an apparatus to really ensure that a developer is doing these things, but it really in making a fair trade-off between the public decisions and the public investments and support for the project moving forward. You can come to an agreement around these things and, and find a fair way to value out all these problems that we're talking about here, but doing it in a way where Google is getting value, the community is getting value, everyone is winning. Uh, and so really, I think when we talk about these things, it shouldn't be about what Google, what's Google's role, what should they do, what they should not do. Uh, the public is giving a lot for this project, and so let's think big. Let's think about what we can accomplish here. Uh, it's, it's not a given that we have to see large-scale displacement from a tech company. We can try to do things a little bit differently. So I'd encourage you to look at the full report. It, uh, four minutes is hard to jam everything, but appreciate the time. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Jeffrey. And last up in this group is Kevin. How is that? What's the pointer? Yeah. Does the pointer work at all? Sure. You might be able to miss this. Okay. All right. Well, here we go. It's going to be kind of like uh, drinking from a fire hose here, okay? Um, <laughs> here we go. So, everybody, um, Gardner, we're just south of the area here in question, the Deridon area. Uh, you can see there to the uh, left 280 and on the right 87 and the kind of the uh, pinkish area there is Gardner itself to the left of that is a neighborhood that's not represented here it's called Gregory Plaza and to the south is North Willow Glen where Harvey is uh, the pink area there that you see is what our neighborhood has the greatest fears of happening and this is a high-speed rail uh, at, a, at an at-grade um, uh, alignment. Uh, there's 35 homes in that um, area there in the pink. 
that uh, part of Gardner that would be uh, either eradicated or uh, uh, would have diminished use. There's 11 homes in North Willow Glen, and I did not count the number of homes that would be affected in uh, Gregory Plaza. Um, so the question that I have, you know, right off the bat there is, you know, single-family homes are part of this housing solution, and high-speed rail would essentially be evicting homeowners. So with San Jose's current cri housing crisis and a cry for zero displacement, why would we eliminate single-family homes? Um, yeah, come on. There's a couple of homes that uh, are half a block away from me. Um, in these would be directly affected. Their backyards are up against the high-speed rail project. Um, current pricings on these anywhere from between about nine hundred thousand to about uh, to seven seven hundred and fifty thousand. In the Gardner area itself, there are about twenty-seven properties that meet the criteria for designation by the San Jose City Council for landmark structures. Um, so we kind of established the fact that Gardner does have uh, a rich hi history. It did uh, start out as a school district in 1894. Um, it comprises mostly of Victorians, neo-colonials, craftsmen, mission revival, cottages, and estates. Um, then after 25 years of conflict and lawsuits, uh, we got awarded a railroad that cut through our neighborhood in 1928. Uh, Willow Glen sued and has no track. Gardner didn't. We got the tracks. So by about 1955, we were declared blighted. What you see there on the upper left is the Word of Faith Church, and you see the train right next to it. If high-speed rail were to do their uh, at-grade alignment, they would uh, be taking out that church as well. Um, so that's not, not something we're looking forward to. Also, we have 280 that was built through our neighborhood in the 70s. And by the 90s, by the time Highway 87 was constructed, Gardner's about one quarter of the size that it was in 1894. So this raises some serious questions on social equity and justice. You know, how much more does one neighborhood have to put up with? Uh, this is a good look at what would happen with Fuller Park. Um, you see on the left what it currently looks like, and then an artist's rendition from, I believe, the high-speed rail people themselves of what they would do to Fuller Park uh, to make the high-speed rail uh, go through this area. They would take out the trees and uh, have to raise it some so that they could not make it a roller coaster ride coming in the Derridon. In the lower right, you will see there, I wish I could have got that bigger, um, that's a, their high-speed rail simulation of what it would look like going through you know, the neighborhood. Look at that wall. That is appalling. It, and, and what's north of that is downtown San Jose. What's south of that is um, North Willow Glen and Willow Glen itself. Um, we spent $850,000 building that park, and that's, that's a shame to see that that might get destroyed. Uh, another problem we have here is the isolation of Gregory Plaza. At the current uh, at-grade alignment, they would uh, be uh, taking out one of the main access egress roads for, the, uh, for that neighborhood. There's ground zero. Um, it would be uh, con so congested with trains, the way they have it planned, that that street would be essentially closed down all the time. So. As Jeffrey said, yes, we're worth protecting. Um, during the SNI days, San Jose invested about $15 million in Gardner. Residents took uh, over and did their part as well. There's some new townhomes where there used to be a, a taxi lot. And uh, the home there in the lower left is a new Habitat for Humanity house right next to the railroad tracks that would get obliterated if they put high-speed rail through. That just got built in like 2016. So we know that Google, in their uh, uh, wisdom, has said that innovation is a healthy disregard for the impossible. And I don't think what we're asking for is the impossible, but 
we have had four neighborhoods get together, Gardner, North Willow Glen, Gregory Plaza, and Delmas Park, and you can read this later. These are some of the things that we will not support and some of the things we will support. Um, in conclusion, what we're really after is either um, a tunnel option, which we have not heard about from the city yet, or an aerial bypass that will go along 280 and Highway 87 and thus uh, avoid our neighborhood. We do have a support paper out that we have sent to our council members, and if uh, I would probably will get this distributed at some later date so that all of you can take a look at it. Thank you for your time. Great. Thank you very much, Kevin. You can hold on to that. If we can give a big hand to this group as well, thank you very much. Uh, so just li like last time, we want to open it up for discussion, and I really encourage you, if you have specific questions for the panel, please go ahead and ask. If not, try to reduce just the general statement so that we can continue through this process and end on time tonight. So, David, can I, I make one quick comment? Sure. I forgot to um, uh, acknowledge a couple of people that helped me with uh, the deck. One is Bill Rankin, who is uh, chairman or president of Save Our Trails, and has been very active in, in uh, working on getting the Three Creeks Trail and the Los Gatos Creek uh, Trail done. And also Martin Delson was the one that found the 1968 picture, and he's also on uh, Save Our Trails. Great. Thank you, Harvey. Uh, Shiloh, would you like to start? Please name an organization. Great. Thank you all. My name is Shiloh Ballard, uh, representing the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition. Um, I wanted to ask about the issues around gentrification and displacement. Um, in the previous panel, we had someone who mentioned um, and I may be misunderstanding what was said, um, so I apologize. Um, but gentrification is going to happen. It's inevitable. Um, it's not so bad, necessarily. Uh, and then we have folks here saying, you know, we need to make sure that we are planning for gentrification and displacement and ensure that our communities don't get gentrified or people don't get displaced. So I'm wondering if you guys can comment on just kind of squaring these two, uh, these two notions. Yeah, so I mean, the idea that, <coughs> so, you know, the idea that you're having higher income people come into the community, that there's re revitalization, that, you know, that's a good thing for a community. What, what's, what the problem with gentrification is, is that leads to people being displaced. People have traditionally been there for a really long time. Um, and that leads to a lot of other negative consequences for a community, like I mentioned. Um, if the, it's interesting, like if you look at the UC Berkeley study, and maybe maybe we should send it around, um, it actually points to interventions that the city made, including having a lot of affordable housing in um, in the, the Deerdon area that um, led, that prevented a lot of the displacement that could have happened from happening in that community. So when we're talking about Google coming into uh, San Jose, into the Duradon area, it's going to lead to a lot of benefits to this community. There's going to be an influx, influx of wealth into the Duradon station area. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot more opportunity. Who is that opportunity for um, and who is going to benefit from it is a big question. And if we don't, as a city, as a community, take steps to try to mitigate um, the potential negative aspects of displacement, potential displacement, um, it's going to lead to a community where only really, really wealthy people are going to live. And people who have traditionally been here for 30, 40, 50 years for generations are not going to benefit from that wealth that Google will bring. I don't know. So, so um, particularly um, a lot of the communities in the east side, there's a historic neighborhood, the Mayfair community, the birthplace of um, organizing for Cesar Chavez. Uh, that neighborhood is already seeing uh, displacement. Um, you're going to other areas, and we talk about you know building giant high rises in the east in the east side. Well, we do have a thing there; it's called an airport. Um, so it's a little harder to to kind of deal with that. You know, just so so it's not like let's just solve it by glibly saying we'll build on the east side because what you're building it, it, every everything that you do is and these are fragile neighborhoods. Um, I think that it's a, it's a social cost that a lot of us are also worried about, not just the economic displacement, but what happens when you have uh, more kids in a smaller area trying to study, when you have the workforce, essential workforce housing, 
uh, is, is eliminated, uh, what people are going to do, how are people going to handle this, uh, more people are very tired from long commutes. There's a lot of other kinds of effects that happen when you displace, but it really comes down to the human factors. What kind of city do we really want to be? Uh, I think that's really the kind of question that we need to ask and that we need to invest as much as we're going to be investing in you know, economic development for a multinational corporation that will have its will have definite effects uh, for a lot of folks benefiting here in San Jose. But we also have to ask, who do we want to be as a city? You know, um, and who do we want to live around our, who, who do we want to have around our, our table, as it were, uh, in the city? And I think that if we value these neighborhoods that have, that have uh, kind of organically grown in San Jose, and they're very fragile neighborhoods, uh, but also extremely amazing neighborhoods, uh, we, will, we, we may risk to lose uh, some, uh, quite a bit of that if we are not careful in planning for displacement. We, we know that's going to happen, but the question is the city uh, has an obligation if they want to preserve these, these neighborhoods. So it's really ultimately a question, not just of economics and building. It's really a question that, that we have to root this in. Who do we want to be at our table? Great. Thank you all. Did you have something yeah, to add? I, okay. I do. Right. You know, I was, um, I bought into North Wilgon in 1983 for the ungodly sum of $74,500. Uh, now they're million dollar houses plus. I bought from an old Italian. Her father bought the house in 1937 from the Southern Pacific Railway. So I was one of the early gentrifiers of the neighborhood, obviously, because I was a clinical nurse specialist for Kaiser. And I had a decent income, which at the time was $12 an hour. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the reality is that many, many, many of the families in my neighborhood have lived in the neighborhood for 30, 40, 50 years old, uh, years. And they're getting older. The children may live with them, or maybe several you know, children and grandchildren, and they're being priced out. Now, one of the, th the things that's happening is about 60%, I believe, of the Gardner side of the neighborhood is not owner-occupied. So it's, it, and it's because of single-family houses, even though there may be multiple families living in them, or they may be duplexes, they're not under rent control issues. So somehow, when we were creating housing in this area, we've got to find a way to integrate some lower, uh, and extremely low, very low, and low income housing into the uh, affordable and the market rate housing. Thank you, Harvey. Just want to remind folks, there's a number of other comments coming okay. up, yeah, so we can keep quick, it brief. I think it's just really great. important when we think about displacement, you know, Homeowners generally win, renters generally lose. We're a city that's 40% renters in the Dearden area. It's closer to 60% in the data poll that David and his team pulled together. So let's just kind of keep that front in mind. You know, homeowners may win, but renters are, are largely going to lose. And renters, you know, right now have a family income of about $60,000 in terms of their income, not even talking about their wealth. And when you think about homeowners, it's about double that here in the city of San Jose. So I think that's a good starting point. Okay. Um, since I'm in Gardner, and Harvey was talking about it, we have a lot of homeowners who actually rent out their basements, their attics, and their garages to people to rent so that they can uh, afford to have their home. Of course, some of these people have owned it for, uh, say, three or four generations. So they're sitting pretty good money-wise, but they're taking advantage of people who, like Jeffrey says, the renters always lose. And I know that, you know, me, personally, I could not afford to rent on my own place, not even close. Um, so I feel very blessed in that regard. Um, one of the problems we had as a result of the SNI was we did get a lot of improvements for the neighborhood, which was fantastic. But the people were scared. When we rebuilt their streets, I actually had people tell me, Kevin, don't rebuild my street. I don't want my taxes to go up. Now, what they didn't realize is that at least with Prop 13, they were protected by a certain percentage every year that couldn't go up anymore. But, you know, these are people that bought their homes a long time ago. Their incomes never kept up with the pace of the price of the houses. 
And they can't, this is the scary part. If you take away their homes, they can't go and get another, another house somewhere else. They bought so long ago, like Harvey did, you know, where they maybe bought it for $30,000. They're not going to be able to find, when you, and we talk about displacement. If you were to say that, you know, Gardner is an incredibly great place. It's walk, within walking distance of Willow Glen, and it's within walking distance of the Shark Tank and downtown San Jose. There's nothing quite like that. You're not going to find a replacement house for people that lose their houses due to the high-speed rail in that kind of a situation. We could, we said, okay, great, thank you. So I just want to remind you all, housing is obviously a hot topic here tonight. We do have a section of tonight devoted to the solution group and the, um, some of the solutions and an update from that group for you all. So we're going to continue the discussion on housing. I'm going to get through you all here right now, but if we can keep the comments or questions brief, just so we allow enough time to get to the next section, the TED Docs. I think I saw Gene next, and we'll come here to Bill. Name this is Jean Cohen with the uh, Building Trades Council, and I apologize, I, I was late, so this might have already been addressed, but I just wanted to, um, to raise it. I was wondering if any of the panelists um, address the existing partnership between Google and the City of Mountain View right now that is um, regarding community benefits and how that process might inform this effort here. I actually had a, a slide I think you may have seen that I, I, I missed, unfortunately, in my scramble. Um, I think it's important to think about when we think about the city and community benefits, and again, this thought of like, why would Google possibly offer us anything to, to deal with any of these issues we're talking about? Uh, in 2015, when uh, Google was looking to expand its campus in uh, Mountain View, uh, add less than half of the square footage that we're talking about in this project, uh, they had actually offered the city of Mountain View a package of $240 million worth of community benefits between infrastructure improvements, uh, things like a, a police training center, uh, and a substantial amount of affordable housing on site as a part of their development. Uh, and this was in addition to uh, the city of Mountain View had already started to implement uh, their commercial linkage fee. And so for any square foot they developed, Google was going to be on the hook uh, for paying a pretty substantial amount, uh, $24, I believe, a square foot for every square foot of commercial office space uh, mm -hmm. into an affordable housing fund. So it's like, for instance, in San Jose, if we had that same policy just on the linkage fee, not even the $240 million for half of the project they want to build here and community benefits they offer to the city, uh, you'd be talking about another $200 million uh, in terms of affordable housing uh, resources. And so, you know, you think about this project, it's going to be a big project. Uh, the comp that Google tosses out is their uh, uh, Kingsbridge, Kingsbridge? King's Crossing uh, development. That was a million square foot development. Uh, it cost a billion dollars to build. So what does an eight million square foot urban campus for Google look like? It's going to be a pretty expensive project. And so these kinds of community benefits, we need to think, you know, if Mountain View's good enough, I hope San Jose is good enough to ask for some of these things. So Great. Thank you both. And panel, when you grab the mic, if you could also state your name and organization again, just because you have your backs to the the public, we have Bill, and then we'll go to Boris. Uh, Bill Sowers, uh, Downtown Residents Association. This is not really a question for the panel, but uh, we are dealing with macroeconomic problems as a nation, and it's, uh, you know, in spite of Google being here, in fact, I'm looking at Google as being an opportunity. My question can be answered later, and that is, when, when will this group, if at all, be participating in the different phases of uh, decision making. So we're gonna have an MOU, Our, the input would be done in September. Uh, the MOU, which is just a framework, not legally binding by December, and then that will la launch Google into a development agreement. Where do the, uh, the community benefits agreements activities begin and who's responsible for those. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to answer it. I'm not looking for the panel to answer it. But I think that is one of the r reasons why we keep having the same conversations over and over without having to, the ability to say that's going to happen at a different time. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Bill. We'll definitely plan to discuss that, if not at this SOG meeting, at future SOG meetings, and what that process looks like again. And we have an FO FAQ that's going to be coming out that will hopefully help okay. answer that process question a bit more as well. So I appreciate the question. Thank you. Um, next we'll go to Boris and then Norma. 
And thank you. I just, this is Boris Lepke with High Speed Rail. I just wanted to respond a little bit to Kevin's presentation because um, we've spent a lot of time looking at the alignment through San Jose and you know, some of what Kevin shared is from work that we had done previously in about 1617. We have gone through a, a series of iterations of looking at various options. In 2017, we had eliminated everything except for the aerial options. Um, what has happened since then, just to kind of catch everybody up, is that uh, the city had asked us to look at more than one alternative through the area. We, uh, and the city also kind of provided us with um, some, some input and ideas of some options. And one of the concepts that they introduced was extending what's called the blended system. So we had been looking at uh, basically a dedicated high-speed rail only line. Uh, what they kind of put on the table is looking at more of the shared corridor concept that we have uh, north of San Jose towards moving that south. What we've taken since then is in our 2018 business plan introduce a new option of looking at that all the way through and that really has the ability to all the way to Gilroy um, to reduce a lot of those impacts uh, that Kevin you talked about. And we have a lot more work to do to de develop that um, and, and I'd certainly love an opportunity to engage with you in the community on kind of looking at that and um, as well as you know we're, we're still going to have the aerial options as well. We haven't picked an alignment through the city. Um, so I, I just wanted to kind of I think it you know, that while that was something that we had looked at previously, um, that's not really where we're at today. And so I just wanted to clarify that and, uh, again, you know, have an opportunity to continue to engage in that discussion. Great. Thank you very much, Boris. And lastly, we have Norma. Norma Camacho with Santa Clara Valley Water District. And I have a question for Harvey. In looking at your uh, new alignment or proposed alignment for Los Gatos Creek, is that based on any hydro? logic studies or hydraulic studies in, in that fact, have been done? No, it isn't, and it was just something that was thrown out. That particular alignment uh, that uh, Larry calls it a um, napkin uh, line engineering, mm -hmm. uh, basically was trying to find the best route to get uh, bikers and pedestrians off the route without having to cross any streets. Mm -hmm. But no, it didn't deal with any of the hydrologic, and I'm sure that mm -hmm. um, what will come once the hydrologists get a hold of it and the hydraulic engineers get a hold of it will be, look completely different. But the idea is that we want to just daylight it and have ways off of it uh, and as many ramps as we can to get it into the uh, Google area. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I mean, what we can do is take at least a preliminary look at this yeah. and uh, have our engineers um, see if this is a, a just an initial go or no-go. Yeah. Because there's a lot of flooding in that area, and so it's a really sensitive area to really uh, modify or, or touch and reroute. So. Well, you know, uh, the suggestion is that we leave the two channels that are culverts in place and use them as overflow and actually have the stream uh, adjacent to it. So I suspect that's doable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just that the, uh, you know, basically the climate change, the streams have changed, patterns have changed, storm patterns have changed, and so uh, there could be a lot of changes that have occurred in that area. Great. Thank you all again. Uh, we now have four more members. I think, Chris, we had you on, your, on here accidentally. We have Matt. We have Pilar for Leslie, Sarah, and Leslie Hamilton. If you can please step up and bring your nameplates with you, that would be very helpful. Okay, we're going to start with Matt. All right, good evening. Uh, I'm Matt Vanderslice with Greenbelt Alliance. And uh, I thought it would be helpful to, to zoom out to, to a much higher level to talk about um, some of Greenbelt Alliance's perspectives uh, that might be helpful to inform uh, our planning process that we're engaged in right now. So Greenbelt Alliance <laughs> is uh, a nonprofit organization 
working across all nine counties of the San Francisco Bay Area, we're focused on a central challenge, which is how our region uh, handles growth, uh, how the nine counties of the Bay Area grow and develop as we move from a, a population of about 7 million people today to what's projected to be about 9 million people over the next generation. And we're guided by uh, a vision that says uh, that we can protect the natural, agricultural, uh, watershed, farmlands uh, of our region uh, from sprawl development and instead grow uh, in a way that creates uh, amazing places uh, for everyone. And of course, our region has a long way to go to, to achieve that sort of goal. I think we see that today with the housing affordability and displacement crisis that so many of us have been talking about that's uh, having uh, impacts for people uh, in all of our communities, that's driving the extremely long commutes that we're facing. Uh, Silicon Valley has the, the highest percentage of uh, mega commuters, people driving more than 90 minutes a day. Uh, in the entire state of California, worse than, than Los Angeles, which is known for uh, its driving culture. Uh, this is uh, having an impact on our climate uh, with greenhouse gases uh, and uh, um, other air pollution. And, and of course, we see the challenges in a picture that's not showing up. Well, look at that. Imagine, if you will, a map of the Bay Area that we had uh, designed. Uh, we, uh, every five years or so, we do an audit of uh, the entire Bay Area to look at the areas at risk of sprawl development. Uh, and our 2017 report uh, has some pretty stark numbers. 293,000 acres of land, natural and agricultural lands around the Bay Area, still at risk uh, of sprawl development, an area about 10 times the size of San Francisco. In Santa Clara County, that's about 54,000 acres. Uh, of land about half the size of San Jose. Uh, that's iconic places like uh, Coyote Valley at the southern tip of the city, the farmlands of Gilroy. In fact, 56% of the farmland in Santa Clara County is at risk of sprawl development today. So I'd like to unpack our vision for how we could grow uh, instead of, of uh, facing these housing affordability crises, facing the, this, the, the crisis of uh, transportation challenges, the challenges of sprawl. And at an extremely high level, for me, that's creating livable, <laughs> sustainable places uh, with prosperity shared broadly across the community. It's planning processes that engage uh, everyone. It's establishing many uses that, that serve everyone across the income spectrum, uh, that foster healthy lifestyles, that encourage walking, biking, and transit, that create uh, safe streets and family-friendly neighborhoods where uh, mul many generations can live close together and where the safe streets are safe for walking a child to school, that create economic vitality for all residents, uh, and that create great places that are attractive to today's workforce and to, uh, uh, to current residents. And that this will be essential both to improve the quality of life as well as to protect uh, the vital lands of our region. Um, you know, I think we should be thinking about the, the, this in this regional context, that this is a regionally significant uh, uh, decision that we'll be making, and that we should be uh, thinking about the district itself as a regionally significant model for sustainable and equitable development. We should be ensuring that the benefits are shared broadly across the city uh, and the region, particularly on these issues of housing affordability, mobility, connectivity. And that lastly, we should be linking this regionally significant development with investments in regionally significant natural and agricultural lands to create uh, the, the next great amenity that will serve um, uh, the, the, the many people who are part of the Deerdon area, as well as all of those folks uh, across San Jose and the rest of the region, um, to, do, to do something that is really uh, iconic, bold, uh, and that serves uh, the next generation well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, next up is Pilar. Not Leslie. 
Hi, I'm Pilar. I am going to be very unsuccessful in impersonating Leslie Grisilia. Um, my name's Pilar. I am the deputy director of SV at Home. Um, for those of you that don't know SV at Home, we are a three-year-old organization that is laser-focused on policy, advocacy, and capacity building around affordable housing. Um, we work in all um, in, in Santa Clara County and its cities, um, and we also participate in um, policy and planning conversations at the regional level. Um, our, I, I'm going to talk about. I'm going to spend all four minutes talking about the problem. I'm not. I'm joking. Um, we really are. Uh, we're a shop that is spending 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I'm really trying and struggling to, um, to ensure that we have housing affordability for all. Um, when we go and advocate for affordable housing, whether through policies or through land use campaigns, we're thinking everyone from folks that are homeless or on fixed incomes to folks that are working our service sector and retail jobs to folks that are getting paid what we would consider good wages but because of housing scarcity are priced out of the market. Um, this is the one chart that I'm going to show you. And the major takeaway from here is that from a period, from a 30 year period from 2010 to 2040, the county is supposed to grow or is anticipated to grow by 378,000 jobs. It's supposed to grow by 256 new homes. Um, between 2010 and 2040, we are, um, by 2015, we had already created um, half of the jobs that we were quote unquote allotted. Um, at the same time, we only permitted um, a four, uh, 14% of the housing um, that we are supposed to provide. So the discrepancy, um, we are severely lacking in our housing stock and that's why you're hearing that it's such a big issue. A um, couple of things that we face here in San Jose that I hope will um, kind of be something that we keep in mind as we take advantage of the opportunity that is presented in Daredon. Um, we are a severely sprawling uh, community, and I think Daredon presents an opportunity for us to rethink what density, livability, and equity might look like in our communities. Um, I want to address some of the comments that I heard earlier today. Um, we don't just need housing for one segment of people. The, the unfortunate news is we need housing for everybody. We need it all. The good news is, is that we have some pretty good um, projects here in the, in the Valley that have demonstrated a commitment to doing a significant number of homes. So from SV at Home's perspective, um, what we are really hoping to see out of Daradon in terms of housing are three things. Number one, quantity. We need more housing. Number two, affordability. We need to figure out how to make sure that the community stays affordable um, for everybody. And last but not the least, we need housing that isn't segregated into different pods and clusters. So basically integrating housing with all of the other uses. Um, I have a few slides of projects that we've created. So this is affordable, um, developers have created affordable housing right next to transit, which is a very important piece. Um, the thing that is also I want to stress that's important, we all know the value of standalone affordable housing, affordable housing that's 100% affordable in that building, but I cannot um, stress enough the importance of mixed use and mixed income housing. So um, I heard a comment earlier today that said that developers um, don't like to provide affordable housing in their mixed income projects. That's not true. Um, off of the top of my head, I can name multiple projects that are in the pipeline right now that are delivering 15, 17, 20, and 50% affordable housing. This can be done. What we need is um, political will and leadership but we also need community will. So if we all want to preserve, to maximize the opportunity that Daredon brings and to preserve affordability for everyone as well as the people that are gonna inevitably come and work here, um, we need to work together to make sure to ask for those three things. More housing, be bold and strive for more affo um, housing affordability for everyone and make sure that housing is 
um, appropriately integrated as a use within the whole Deardon area and not sanctioned off into one um, piece of um, the project type. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pilar. Uh, next up is Sarah. <laughs> okay. Can you all hear me? Okay. Um, hi, I'm Sarah McDermott. I'm presenting today on behalf of South Bay Labor Council. I work for an affiliate of the Labor Council, Unite Here Local 19. We represent hospitality workers, and I serve as Local 19's political director, and I'm a senior research analyst focused on development. So I just wanted to quickly share who we are uh, the Labor Council is the local AFL-CIO representing Santa Clara and San Benito counties, and SBLC represents 100 unions and more than 100,000 members. And our primary goal is to advance candidates, causes, and policies that benefit working families. So, what do we want? This was supposed to dramatically come up, but it's all been put on the slide at once. So, <laughs> so <laughs> we want uh, dignity for working families. So what does dignity mean? I like to think that dignity means being compensated fairly for hard work and being treated with respect and having a decent quality of life. And in San Jose, the question around dignity right now is really having the dignity of working hard and being able to live in the community that you work in and provide for your family. So what's the problem? The combination of low wage job growth and the housing crisis is not sustainable for working people, the environment, or our communities. For every tech job we add, we add four service jobs to this economy and as Pilar presented, our housing has not been added at that ratio. So we have to think about how development impacts working people. So I wanted to share how we evaluate how development projects are going to impact working people, because I think that's important for understanding our thinking around a development project such as the one we're discussing. So on construction, um, does the project have a commitment to local hire and apprenticeship programs? And is there an understanding with the building trades? Sorry, I'm having technical difficulties. Oh. What? Yeah, I got it. OK. Um, for future operations at the project site, Will the project create quality jobs for pe the people of San Jose? Does the developer have an agreement with the unions who represent potential service workers? Will the business hire responsible contractors? And will the business agree to publicly report job creation and distribution statistics? On the environment, how will the project impact workers as residents and commuters in San Jose? How will the project impact the housing crisis, displacement, and the houseless? And finally, does the project offer community benefits that will enhance the lives of working people in San Jose? These are inclusive of the previous uh, things I brought up, but can also include things around health and public services. So finally, I wanted to, I gave myself the hard task of trying to come up with one question that encapsulated how we'll evaluate this question uh, about the Google project. And for this project, I think the real question we have is, will the hardworking people who build and work at the future campus have the basic dignity of being able to provide for their families and live in this community? Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. And finally for this group, we have Leslie. All right, 
right, so um, Guadalupe River Park Conservancy, our mission to provide community leadership for the development and active use of Guadalupe River Park and Gardens through education, advocacy, and stewardship, the vision being a dynamic public space and iconic destination for San Jose and the region. We're an independent 501c3 nonprofit seeking to leverage the public's investment in the park by attracting private funds for continued development and operations. Uh, just about us, uh, we use the park as a natural lab to engage students in hands-on learning. As advocates for the park, we work to draw people to it through events such as pumpkin, Pumpkins in the Park in October and our Super Guadalupe River Run in February. We meet with uh, elected officials and civic leaders to build support for the park, which has been devastated by city budget cuts. We're in charge of the Rotary Play Gardens operations and maintenance and hold up its beautiful design and level of maintenance as standards for future park development. We aspire to take over all operations eventually, as is the state of practice in large parks across the country. We engage volunteers in the park and picture are some of the companies that sent volunteers out for service days in the last three months. We also coordinate uh, volunteer, or, uh, individuals and last year had over 23,000 volunteer hours in the park. So hopefully some of you in the back can see this, but, and I don't know. So the river park starts just, um, just at Highway 280 here and moves north to Highway 880. Of course, the river keeps going to the bay. But this is, these are the definitions of Guadalupe River Park. Um, um, oftentimes, you'll hear reference to Discovery Meadow um, over here by the Tech Museum or Arena Green as kind of independent parks, but I, I'm claiming them all, right? This is a chain of parks. It's Guadalupe River Park and Gardens. Um, I've got a little branding issue here, but I want you folks to leave knowing that it's all one park. Um, uh, the park has been subject of tons of planning, and I wanted to show there that there were, um, we started uh, looking at, at flood control planning back in the 1940s. And uh, under Al Rufo, mayor back in the 60s, looking at the river park planning. And construction got underway in the 1990s. Army Corps of Engineers and um, Santa Clara Valley Water District came to a halt uh, over the um, uh, potential lawsuit by environmental groups and fishery folks um, worried about the salmon and trout in the river. And so a new design was uh, uh, designed that actually has bypass. I don't think I'm working anymore here. There's bypass channels that pick up right be behind uh, Children's Discovery Museum, let out by Adobe, pick up again um, just uh, before confluence and after confluence and let out at Coleman Avenue. Um, so preserving some natural areas for, for fish. Um, uh, sorry. The Redevelopment Agency funded um, park improvements once flood control work was completed in 2004. And in recognition of the regional nature of this park, the Santa Clara County contributed um, 15 or $20 million and some of that money went to, to buy Parkland. In 2009, we worked with Ken Kay on some visioning, and I like this slide. It's way out of date, but partly I like it because it's out of date because it um, it shows we were still recruiting the A's. Dang it, and I can't get my little pointer to work. Um, but uh, you know, it's uh, HP Pavilion, which is now SAP Center. It shows Adobe building on the former San Jose Water Company site. So. It helps me understand how much change can happen in nine years and how much change we're looking at until BART gets here. Um, but it also shows beautifully how both Los Gatos Creek and um, Guadalupe River Park frame this area and as downtown expands to the west. Um, um, what got me involved in this project nearly 20 years ago was Guadalupe River Trail. I was a runner and the notion of being able to run car free was just really attractive. And so. The river trail is paved from just south of 280 at Virginia Street all the way out to Alviso. It connects to the Highway 237 trail. It connects out to the Coyote Creek. Obviously, Los Gatos Creek is coming in, the Three Creeks Trail. It's just, it's just a wonderful um, hub of the city's trail network. Um, when the five-mile gap just south of Ch uh, Virginia to Chinawith connects, it'll be, um, you'll be able to go from the Bay Trail in Alviso all the way down to the, the Bay the Ridge Trail in, in Allen Valley, and of course, once Los Gatos Creek connects out to uh, Lexington. So just a phenomenal network. Parks play a huge role in the vitality of communities. They serve as community gathering places, provide relief from urban intensity for residents, and are great equalizers, bringing people together across social, economic, and racial divides. As we continue to build high-rise housing in downtown, parks and open space are critical to the quality of life. 
We have many challenges uh, due to San Jose's ongoing fiscal problems. Parks are frequently viewed by city leadership as liabilities instead of assets. And examples abound of well-designed parks in other cities spurring economic development. But San Jose's fiscal woes lead to short-term thinking, such as the airport's desire to remove land from Guadalupe Gardens. San Jose needs to think bigger about parks and open space. Uh, one more, one more, oh, not that one. Uh, there we go, opportunities. Long term, a dynamic public space, iconic destination for San Jose and the region. Uh, in the shorter term, some of the things we're working on are additional activations, temporary art, um, signature art, revenue generating features such as a beer garden or cafe to fund maintenance and um, add things for people to do, uh, moving the carousel and participating in the 2020 Parks Bond. Great. Thank you very much, Leslie. A big applause for this final group. Excellent. So like we did last time, if there's any questions for the group, if you want to flip your nameplates, Edward, we'll start with you. Uh, I will say uh, we've been fortunate enough to have Ricardo and Joe from a Google Walk neighborhood with us. One thing we mentioned as an example, we've talked here about thinking differently about the use of the space, the creation of the public spaces. One thing that we mentioned repeatedly was the way in which the Rotary Play Garden was designed and is operated and is maintained as there are lessons there where it is a partnership where the city was involved but the corporate and the volunteers and the city all working together to, accom to accomplish something that the individual components could not. And I think on a wider range, the green space and the parks in this project, there are a lot of lessons to be learned there. So we were fortunate to be able to pass along some of that information to the gentleman from Google when we walk the neighborhood with them. Great. Thank you. Shiloh, you're next. Leslie, I'm curious, um, and you know, the, the trail and gardens are just a wonderful gem in San Jose, and there's so much potential there to make it even better. Uh, really simple question. Um, why, why don't we currently have commercial uses in there, like a little coffee cart or, you know, you mentioned at the end a beer garden. Like, what's, what are the barriers to making that happen real quick? Part, part of it's um, the way that the parks have operated, and so the, we were working with the parks department to, to change some of those um, um, operations and policies, if you will. Part of it is one of the things we want to do is we want to be the leasing agent so we can capture the revenue to put it back. Currently, the mechanism is that it goes to the general fund. So there's some, there's some things that need to get tweaked, and we're working on it. Sorry about that. Harvey? Oh, Harvey Darnell, North Wolf. I um, wanted to you, uh, comment on what Nicole was saying and Pilar is saying in terms of uh, creating mixed use, uh, mix, excuse me, mixed income housing. Uh, I found my experience in, in working with a number of projects that I've been told over and over again that it's very difficult to finance, to get the financing done if you have mixed income housing. That there are different mechanisms for low income housing versus market rate housing and consequently they've not been able to uh, make it happen on the projects that I've worked on uh, in, from the standpoint of adjacent to North Willow Glen. So the question I have is how we can get, you've obviously had some successes um, as uh, Silicon uh, SV at home, how we can get some of those developers that know how to make that happen uh, as preferred providers of this so, and get them involved in the, uh, organ uh, the area, in perhaps in some other MOUs besides the Google MOU. Um, thanks for the question, Bilar from SV at Home. Um, the truth of the matter is that these developers that you're speaking of um, already work in San Jose and already work in the Valley. Um, just a really quick example, um, Sobrato, Summer Hill related, um, Sand Hill. Um, what it really is is that uh, developing housing, mixed income housing, affordable housing, is challenging because of the financing. Um, but we have, this is true for all of California. 
So the flip side of that is that it's very challenging, very difficult to create housing in California, but you have a development community that is used to being put through the paces. So it is a very sophisticated, affordable housing group of developers, as well as for-profit developers who understand that the expectation here in the Bay Area is that they must do mixed income. Um, so those developers that I mentioned, um, they build today. Um, more often than not, what it really is, is um, they are responding to expectations that have been set for them through formal policies by cities or through partnerships with community and support. So one example that I'll give is that in the city of Mountain View, um, the project that someone had kind of brought up, North Bayshore, which is also Google, um, where Google, the city, and a very big coalition of advocacy, uh, community-based organizations and interest groups all partnered together to craft an incentive structure that would incentivize 20% of affordable housing out of 10,000 new homes. So that has been done. Um, that's a planning stage. Um, there are many projects in the city of Mountain View, in the city of Sunnyvale, um, Paul, Santa Clara, where um, the developers are coming in. And baseline rules in those cities require at least 15% affordable housing, but because of other factors and expectations that those cities have put in play, the developers will come in with 17% 20% affordable housing. So it's being done now. It, these are not developers that are not within our community. They are here. So the question I have is affordable uh, it can indicate a, a, a house uh, for a family for a household income of $120,000. So how do we make sure that we get the VLI, ELI, and the LI folks get covered? Um, I'll hand them um, the, I just, uh, that's very important and because we are an affordable housing advocacy organization, I want to answer that. Um, so when we say affordable housing, it's not just for a family of four at 120. It all is different households. So VLI and, and low income, so very low income housing and low income housing, which is pretty much 80% AMI or below. So folks that are making less than $94,000 $94, and less, often these projects come about by leveraging state tax credits, so low income housing tax credits. The other group of people, the moderate income group of people, that we don't have a specific public funding source for that, so you need to target incentives so that developers will do it. And now I will surrender them. Matt, just in, in the interest of time, if we can keep the response short just so we can get to the next section on housing, that would be excellent. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I was just going to add that I think one of the challenges we've seen over the last almost a decade is, is that we were faced with a difficult situation because of a, uh, a legal decision that made it harder to do mixed income projects. Now with the passage of the state housing package last year, the passage of AB 1505, communities can put back in place inclusionary housing programs. And so we're going to see many more communities across the peninsula and across the Bay Area putting back in place these policies that really encourage mixed income uh, uh, developments. So that's a very good sign for the Bay Area. Great, thank you. And we have one last question, comment, Paul, that's you. And then we're gonna move on to the next section. So this is for Leslie Paul Escobar with the San Jose Downtown Residents Association. We uh, actually had the Google walkthrough with our downtown uh, this past weekend. Paul, I'm sorry, could you name an oh. organization just for the... Yeah, I, I did. Paul Escobar with the San Jose Downtown Residents Association. Uh, so uh, just a, a couple things I'm just curious to get your reaction to. Um, for for the, the parks and the, and the open space, one thing that we talked a lot about uh, particularly with St. James Park, but I think it also applies to the Guadalupe Parkway more broadly, is the history, the rich history that exists there. And, and how is that integrated and celebrated? And, and, and how, do we, how do we highlight the layers of history? So I, I would like to just hear a little bit of thinking about how you all have been maybe thinking about that or how it could be integrated. And then the other thing was, uh, and, and I don't know what this could look like because the, the, the Guadalupe Parkway is different uh, at different places along the river, but if you go to Rome and you go along the Tiber, you have, uh, there's a festival that happens every year where they just have the whole river lit up and they have booths everywhere and people just walk along the Tiber and drink, buy food, buy our local crafts. There are some sections of the Guadalupe that I think could lend themselves to that. And, and, and I th 
it would be really wonderful to see that kind of activation too to, to make a, a noteworthy landmark. And those are things that we talked about with Google, but I just wanted to get your, your thoughts on. Sure, so I'll start with history. Um, the, I thought the redevelopment agency did a really nice job of incorporating, working with probably the, the water district to incorporate the flood history. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of art built into um, the walkway. Mm -hmm. There's also um, signage at Little Italy. Um, certainly there's um, a role for more because there is a tremendous rich history. If you continue up the trail past Trimble, you'll see the, the, um, the mammoth sculpture. So. Clearly, uh, there's a celebration of the Ohlone people at the confluence area. So there are, there is public art built in, and I, but I think there's a tremendous uh, opportunity to tell tell a richer story, certainly. Um, and then the, the linear nature of the park really lends itself to, to festivals and celebrations. We do have salmon and trout and beaver and fox and all, we have an amazingly rich habitat in that area. And so I think there's, there's probably times of the year where we could be sensitive to that habitat and not disrupting. But I think there are plenty of opportunities where we could take advantage of the lovely weather that we have in this area and, and have outdoor celebrations and markets and the like. Great. Hello. Oh, Hello. Here we are. Thank you again for fantastic presentations, you all. That was really inspiring. Thank you again. That was excellent. Excellent stuff. So now we're going to transition to the next topic, um, which we've heard a lot about here tonight, which is the housing piece. and. Just a quick update of ideas that is starting to come out of the Housing Solution Group. Um, they'll be coming back again later in the SOG meetings. And I just want to remind the public, the next section is going to be public comment. So if you can go ahead and um, bring me your comment cards, that would be great. Over to Lori. Yeah, we want to make sure there's time for all the public comments before 9. So that'll affect how long we have to talk about housing here. So please uh, turn in your cards to Dave as soon as you can. Thank you. Sorry for all the text on this slide. We just know these slides live on and don't want this, uh, the following slides to be taken out of context. We want it to really emphasize that the following slides are draft and preliminary. The Housing Solution Group has met twice, but is scheduled to meet again on July 10th. Uh, this, as we all know, is the, the main topic, housing displacement is the main topic facing this group. And it's complicated and it comes up often. We heard a lot of that in the TED Talks tonight. So we just wanted to build in a little bit extra time for this particular topic. And we did get feedback from some of you that you wanted to make more time during these advisory group meetings with the whole group present uh, to talk about housing. So we'll just give a very, very brief overview of what the solution group has been discussing um, and Knowing that the, the TED Talks tonight, I counted eight of them are on the Housing Solution Group. So they did a much better job than I would in articulating the issues uh, around the topic. So um, with that, here is a, a summary of what the group members have expressed in terms of their concerns about the future and the given uh, potential development in the Deardon Station area. So it's around driving up housing prices even more, exacerbating the displacement problem. Uh, a lot of the conversation is about citywide. It's not just about local Deardon Station area impacts. It's about the effect on existing neighborhoods throughout the city, including the east side. Uh, there's discussion on uh, high-speed rail alignment impacts and a big theme too is just to how is this pr uh, project going to affect San Jose and what we know it to be today and how diverse it is and how it could potentially change that. So those are the types of concerns that the group uh, has discussed. Certainly not a complete list, but an overview. Likewise, they have discussed many desired outcomes, what we wanna see uh, from this project. Um, so here's just a super high-level summary, uh, looking at both the city-wide scale and a more localized scale of what those outcomes uh, could be. 
So in general, there is a strong desire to be very bold in addressing displacement and generating more affordable housing throughout the city. I want to emphasize throughout the city on that one. Uh, in terms of the more localized impacts to the station area and surrounding it, uh, there's a lot of discussion around how can uh, the desired outcome would be to preserve the variety of homes and the character that exists in those nearby neighborhoods. And, but while also accommodating that reinvestment and redevelopment in the neighborhood to continue to improve the, the quality of life there. Um, ultimate goal, uh, some members have said no direct or indirect displacement from San Jose. You know, residents that live here now should not be pushed out and there should be no increase in homelessness. So that's been a stated goal of uh, at least some of the group members. So the solution group has raised many ideas for how to address the concerns and achieve the desired outcomes. The following slides list some of those potential solutions. And so tonight uh, we developed a little bit of a different framework for how to present those solutions, uh, just following the general confusion about what is the role of Google versus what is the role of the city, what is long term and ongoing versus what can be done in the short term. So we are hopefully this uh, the next few slides can help provide a little more clarity around that. Wait for it. <laughs> Why does this not work sometimes? And I've been working with Lori um, to try to help capture the ideas around housing and anti-displacement. So um, this is restating again some of the things that have been talked about the solution group. Again, the group's not done with its work yet, so this is a preliminary report back on some findings, and there's definitely more work to do about honing this and prioritizing. But in brief, what is it that the city and its partners could and should do? First, we talked a lot about creating affordable housing in general and that the need for resources. Um, also, resources being used for preservation of existing affordable homes and existing naturally affordable homes through different laws and policies. Um, then the production itself needs to happen and there are different ways that can work with land use incentives and helping developers find sites and um, trying to help lower density areas like single family detached neighborhoods create homes and opportunities through accessory dwelling units. Um, and then ob obviously all the VTA development sites, you know, what is it that we can do to take full advantage of those places where housing can go and accelerate those. And then um, we talk, we've talked a lot about uh, anti-displacement policies and tools itself and those protections that tend to protect tenants more. Costa Hawkins is a frequently cited um, item that folks support working on its repeal so that rent control programs could be broadened, rent stabilization, if the city so chose. And, um, and that the legal defense of, of uh, residents is really an important function and helping to fund that when the market doesn't supply that naturally is a role that the city can play. And then trying to help folks who may be displaced and may end up with a housing voucher help with policies or uh, approaches that help those people with a voucher get accepted into the market rate housing stock because that's very difficult in our hot market. And then some folks have been talking about our existing rent stabilization programs, our, our apartment rent ordinance, and that it, it could be stricter. There are lots of other neighboring communities that have stricter rules, although we just went through a few years working on that. <laughs> It's like the Air Force. Sorry. This side. That would be nice. Thank you. Uh, regarding the role of development in the Deardon Station area, there's been discussion, obviously, that housing could and should go in Deardon and that it should be high density. That could be supporting employees and or commuters um, along the Caltrain line or along the BART line. Um, that inclusionary units really should be built on site, that being right at transit's a perfect opportunity for affordable units that helps reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and that fees are not as good, that 
we need the units in those locations, and that the percentage of affordable units for inclusionary purposes or for a policy that would look like inclusionary should be higher than the citywide average, and 25% has been suggested, um, which parallels our urban villages standards. And then the fourth item, to really try to avoid displacement, um, but that if you can't avoid displacement of given residents in given buildings, that there needs to be compensation and some assistance to those people, obviously, and trying to help keep them within our community. And keeping going, um, that resources need to be um, paid for <laughs> to administer and develop anti-displacement policies and to preserve existing affordable and that there were some ideas about ways that that could happen through contribution of funds to the city or to partners and um, or city dedication of different revenues to help fund those uses. Um, uh, linkage fee was one idea that was frequently <coughs> cited, revenue from land transactions and that really the community benefits agreement, as was talked about in the TED Talks, was kind of a vehicle for all of that and an affordable housing fund and other uses for affordable could be worked into the uh, community benefits agreement so that, and then, and then th many parties would be involved in that administration. Thank you. So, some of the group's ideas for how resources could be used basically was to build affordable housing and again, that's not just near Deridon, it's throughout the city. Um, and then focus on land in places, especially close to transit, because that helps reduce housing costs for residents, obviously. Uh, and then really for those properties that are worth saving, that are reasonable density and those are in the in impacted areas, um, maybe there's an acquisition um, and rehab product or strategy to go in and help um, lo secure long-term affordability for certain properties. The fourth item was um, ownership. Obviously, renters are not the only folks we need to serve housing needs for, and that really home ownership opportunities need to be increased, and there are different models to do that and to reduce costs to the buyers at the same time. Um, fifth, which we mentioned, was legal defense for those facing evictions. And sixth, really, how is it that we can, it's a how, how do we focus our resources on neighborhoods that we know are going to be really affected in a bad way? Yeah, so that was the last slide. Um, with that, we I'd like to open it up to the solution group members on the housing displacement team to uh, build upon this and reflect on it. And then uh, we'll plan to stop discussion at 8.45 to do public comment and then just a few minutes of wrap up after that. So with that, uh, solution group members. just want to say thanks to the staff for uh, doing a good job of uh, compiling that. I mean, it probably looks to folks outside of the group like a lot, but I think uh, the, oh, Jeffrey Buchanan with Working Partnerships. Uh, I think based on today's conversation, I mean, this is the biggest challenge before us as we look at this project. And so uh, the breadth of, uh, of concepts and ideas, I think, just reflects the, the scope of the challenge. And so, um, you know, just want to thank the staff for, for uh, doing a good job of reflecting uh, uh, the good ideas before the committee. I'm just going to go. Um, Pilar from SV at Home. Um, thanks to the staff for uh, summarizing what was a lot of information. Um, I, um, I think one point of clarification that's good to um, say is that the compilation um, is kind of a little bit of, um, I guess, a compilation of all of the ideas that kind of came up. So different sort of like members of the subgroup have different thoughts. I mean, I think that's what this captures. Um, and I think I didn't hear it mentioned, um, but I think the other important piece that at least from SV at Home's um, concern is that when we consider affordable housing, um, all of those income groups that you guys cited, but also um, moderate income households who are also priced out of the market. Um, so I believe um, that was part of the conversation that we had in the subgroup that I didn't say reflected today, but thank you. This is Jean Cohen with the Building Trades Council. I just have a 
maybe a process question. The list of solutions and just that summary was very impressive and a lot of the suggestions on there seem to be public policy or legislative uh, related, especially with some government agencies that um, might be in Sacramento or Washington, D.C. So I know that the city has a, I think maybe a legislative priorities process and just making sure that we have the opportunity as SAG members to influence that process or to just be informed about that process so that we can make sure some of the ideas that are being generated here are aligned with that document. Thank you. Um, and actually, Lee Wilcox oversees the intergovernmental relations function for the city very ably. Thank you, Lee. And um, yeah, it's a very good point, and we do have legislative guiding principles every year. Many of them, like find more money for affordable housing, it's always on our list. Um, but it's a really good piece, point that we should think about the intersection of exactly which strategies works. Thank you. So we can open it up to all SOG members. Oh, sorry, Stephen, I didn't see you there. So Steve McMahon was saying, if I know it's late, and I should probably think this through more thoroughly before I say it. Um, <laughs> I'm really curious about the functionality of the train station. So if you build a business park next to it, isn't the idea that housing somewhere else could bring employees in? Because the city's mix of business to residents is upside down compared to a lot of other places. If you build low-income housing at the train station, wouldn't you have an expectation that those people go somewhere else? So I'm, I, we need affordable housing for all income levels. But isn't the idea of the train station to move people in and out of the area? So if a low-income housing is used in the transit area, are you expecting them to commute to a job somewhere else versus building all businesses around the train station where people can commute in and building low-income housing in the other na neighborhoods where people are more likely to live and work in the same place? And again, I probably should think this through, but if you put a lot of housing around the train station, are you expecting people to leave I, I versus think that's come into work? Completely order? appropriate question. So I'm glad you asked that. Um, I on number one here under role of development, maximize housing for who is I think the exact question you're asking, and I think Pilar wants to give a stab at answering that. So I think two things um, from the standpoint of uh, I think we're assuming that low wage workers don't exist in Dardan or in the neighboring areas, and I think that that's not true. So housing those people close to where they already work um, is important. And I think we heard from working partnerships and from Sarah that, you know, for every tech job that's created, there is, a, 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 you know, a number of low-wage jobs that are created. So not all jobs that are going to be created in Google are going to be high-paying. So there is going to be a, a, a base group of people that are going to, that are lower wage that need to live there. Um, from the other perspective, um, California has climate change goals. So um, lower income households, if located close to public transportation are actually shown to use public transit more, meaning they're not driving as much, meaning they, it's a very good tool for us to, um, to, to achieve some of the climate goals that we've um, set for ourselves at the state level. Yeah. And again, I want to totally clarify, I agree. That's why I'm trying to reconcile in my mind. If the low-income worker works at the Google campus, you kind of limit the functionality of the train station as like the reason for building the business park there. Because I totally give, people should live and work in their neighborhoods, I get that. But then they won't take the train. But, but they might take the bus. Yeah. So the bus network that goes all over the city, this is gonna be a multimodal transit station. And so um, I get your point about out of town train, but there are local networks that are also gonna be going through Jerry Sorry, let's go for it. There we go. The scaling of Caltrain. Um, it's really late, so I'm going to try to formulate sort of an answer to. Um, I think it's a really good question that's being raised. I think the question around balance is kind of what goes through my head when that question gets asked, and I totally agree that 
low lower wage workers will live and work and play in the Deardon area, but we do have a high percentage of riders who are coming through the station and going to other destinations and vice versa coming into San Jose via Deardon. So I think the question is gonna be about how we balance the development and the transit and modal needs. And I thank you for making the point, it will be an intermodal hub with bus, shuttles, TNCs, Caltrain, high-speed rail, BART. So I think as we get forward, and you've all heard a little bit about the cooperative partner agreement that we've just started down a, a road to do an integrated station concept plan for the transit part. We're gonna be studying how users are forecasted to use the station, and then we'll have to sort of balance that with then what's the right development and how does it coexist with the Google Plan campus. So there's gonna be more to come, I think, on, on this and kind of getting at that question of who's using and how do we support everybody's needs. Maybe, Boris Lucker with High Speed Rail, maybe I can take it back a little bit of on Liz. I mean, I think one way to look at it is that there's a variety of trips that people take. It's more than just commute trips. Um, so people travel for all sorts of different reasons, both kind of within the region, in their neighborhood, and, and across the state as well. Um, so I wouldn't focus just solely on how people get to work necessarily, which is obviously important, but that's not the entire um, spectrum. And I think the other part of it is the, in where there's currently affordable housing is often in areas that are not transit rich. And so Deridon is transit rich and giving people who, who may be lower income access to that transportation, those transportation options is a good thing. And so um, there is a balance to be had. I don't think it's one way or another, but um, certainly you know, there's land use uh, opportunities on, on all fronts and it's about what we could do to make a great neighborhood around the station. So I just had that. Um, working in cities, I don't think ever in ever history have we ever built so much affordable housing that every person that needs affordable housing has it. So Jeff from Google, I deplore you to build so much affordable housing that every low-wage worker at Google lives in that affordable housing. I think that's a really great idea, Stephen. Yeah, I, that's the best idea. Yeah, I, I'd just like to give a second to that one. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you think about um, the uh, the service subcontractors that were, were mentioned, uh, looking at how Google uses service subcontractors and its Mountain View operations, I mean, we could see 8,000 subcontracted service workers as a part of a eight million square foot Google demo. Of course, we you know it's not we don't know for sure. We've only heard so little about this thing. We don't really know what it looks like, but if in fact, it was 8 million square feet of purely Google office space. You have a lot of low-wage workers, folks that are, that are driving people in on the shuttles, that are working in the cafeterias, uh, cleaning, uh, you know, doing things like being security officers. A lot of these folks are, are, are only making around you know, $16 an hour or something. I think we, we did a regional study and we looked in the county. Service subcontract workers make about $19,000 a year on average. Um, so just try to think about you know making rent now, much less making rent after Google comes in. Um, it would be pretty laudable to to really put a focus on mitigating that one piece of the impact. But you know the impacts on rents are going to be felt across the whole city. So it's a time to think big, and I really appreciate uh, the staff recording what was some pretty big thinking coming out of this committee, and I hope that we can carry it forward into some real recommendations that we can all be proud of. Mine are more of a qu couple of questions, just to dovetail on Stephen's point. Um, for every percentage of affordable housing, don't you displace somebody who can't afford that to push it into, I don't know, North Willow Glen and increase the value of it, the rent there or push it out towards 4th Street in Santa Clara and increase the rents there? So question is, don't you displace people like me into other areas if you put in more affordable housing? It's a question. Then the other thing is, is, and I, I don't know, I'd have to go do my homework on this, but it just seems to me if you start putting rent control in place, it usually reduces the amount of supply. Builders aren't incentivized to, to build if you're gonna control their rents. So just a question, point. I don't think anybody ever said build only uh, low wage or, or affordable housing. So if they build 20 
and they built 20 affordable houses and one house for market rate. That's one more than you have now. Right? So we are, that, we are not up against trying to, de we are not deciding how to keep market rate. That'll work on its own. We are trying to figure out how do we stop in San Jose, in this area, what we have seen around the country, and that is low-wage workers being completely displaced and people that's working full-time sleeping in cars and on, and on our sidewalks. And that's a real challenge. And I think the work that's being done is trying to answer that. And I think that if we answer that, uh, not only will there be housing in, in the SAG area, they'll be housing up and down the, 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 uh, the corridors of our transportation. We are not just setting a, a, a template for this one area. I hope we are talking about changing a system where our children can't live in San Jose, right? College graduates that have reasonable jobs can't live here. And so that's the system I think we're changing. And, and I really appreciate the conversation tonight because it, it seems as if everybody is saying, let's do this. And, and we're looking for ways and nuances that we can shift, that we can do that. It looked like it can happen. I, I really appreciate what I've heard tonight. And Steve McMahon was saying unified again. I want to support that as a good clarification for what I was trying to say. I'm just concerned about doing it at the micro level because it really is a barrier-wide issue. And I think we should also be careful with the terminology. Um, I find affordable housing a little bit misleading because it's affordable to a lot of people right now, which is why the housing stock is so low. What we really want to say is affordable housing across all income levels. Because if you look at the number of homes for sale, clearly people can afford the inventory in San Jose because they move within 30 days. We need to have a barrier-wide solution to affordable housing across all income levels. A custodian should be able to live in their neighborhood. A bus driver should be able to live in their neighborhood. And we need more affordable housing across all income levels. And my point about the Deardon Station is I've always heard San Jose want to become less of a bedroom community so that we don't house people and they work elsewhere. We would like to let other communities house them and have them come work here, which I thought was a major goal of Deardon. For housing, it needs to be much more citywide, and it's a policy decision. Is the city of San Jose going to commit to affordable housing across all income levels? I think saying affordable housing might be a middle, little misleading because the market determines whether people will buy or sell unless the city as a policy intervenes to change the natural market. I appreciate your help busting those terms <laughs> that mean different things to different people. I think housing at all price points is exactly what we're talking about. Thank you. So we're running pretty short on this conversation. Who has their thing up, Matt and Paul? OK, so those will be the final two. I'm sorry to cut it short. I know you're just getting started, but we do have some public comments. So Matt? Matt Vanderslice with Greenbelt Alliance. Thank you, Laurie and Kristen, for that, that summary. It sounds like there was a very um, yeah, useful conversation coming out of the solution group. I'm really excited about the ideas that are, that are bubbling up there, and particularly addressing both the production of new homes and actions that can help preserve affordability of existing homes, and this idea of providing homes for people all across the income spectrum that can be part of the Deardon neighborhood to create an inclusive uh, neighborhood as well as uh, across the entire city to help um, make solutions that are, are citywide. I wondered if you could expand a little bit on the point three that's on the slide here, and, and I think it might be just a helpful piece of context about what goals has the city already set in terms of the type of, of inclusivity that it's aiming for uh, in, in all 70 urban villages so that we can think about that as in comparison to the Deardon site, which is a particularly important uh, economically hot uh, spot within the city where we might be able to do something that is that is perhaps more ambitious. Thanks, Matt, for your comments. Um, our inclusionary program, if I can, if I have it memorized correctly, and my director is not here, so, um, so I could get back to you with the exact requirements, but it's a 15% citywide requirement. You can either build the units or pay fees or provide other in, you know, in lieu options, if you will. Um, it, is, it is for um, 
for rental, it's at moderate, which is 60% of AMI, or I'm sorry, at 80% of AMI. They were calling it moderate under our um, ordinance. And then also, I think at 50%, Pilar is checking me, which is very low income, 50% of area median. So uh, that's the rental requirement um, for the for sale requirement. It's all at low slash mod, which really means moderate under the state code. And the urban village's goal is a 25% affordability goal. And I believe all of that is supposed to be uh, low income at 60% AMI or less. And of that 25%, 15 of the 25% goal um, on the books right now is for extremely low income for 30% AMI or below. And so, um, and then VTA is here. And we're, we've been thinking about how does this sync up with the VTA station area development and the, their kind of system-wide goals. So VTA could comment on that too. Thank you, Jim Lawson with VTA. We do have a uh, very aggressive program with our development around stations. And to the point that Stephen made earlier, there are a lot of reasons that people, people travel and there are good uh, good reasons to have origins and destinations at those locations, and in the case of Dearden, a combination of origins and destinations could be a good thing. Uh, we've got a couple of projects uh, that are underway. All of them uh, at this point are uh, inclusive of uh, some level of affordability by direction of our board. Paula support with the San Jose Downtown Residents Association. Uh, thank you for this presentation. And uh, you know, a lot of these goals are, I think, very laudable. And I, I appreciate them listed out here. I, I just have a question. And it, it might be too big for now. So if it is, let me know. But if you go up to Seattle, you'll see 40, 50 cranes in the sky. And they're building like crazy. We're, we're building a lot in San Jose, especially relative to the other communities around us. But it's nothing like that. And we're talking here about a lot of housing. So what are the current obstacles that prevent San Jose, and uh, the hottest housing market where there's an extraordinary amount of demand? What, what prevents us from already building at this kind of scale? And, and how will it be different in this context? I'm going to agree with you that that is a, too big of a question to answer right now. Um, but I know we have lots of experts here that will be taking that back to the solution group. And so I really appreciate the fresh perspectives that non-housing solution group members had, reminding us to think about the terms, define them, think about the goals and define them. Um, I also appreciate the fact that we had transit people in the room to offer the perspective on uh, how to maximize the transit opportunity of it. So I think there's some really good nuggets here in this discussion that um, the solution group can think about on the next uh, round. So thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you very much. So we're going to now move on to public comment. I think we have about seven folks that wanted to speak. I'm going to name the first three if you want to be ready. Uh, we're going to have Robert Aguirre, Sandy Perry, and Blair. I don't know how much time I have. Two minutes? Two minutes. OK. My name is Robert Aguirre, and um, I work very closely with people that are in the houseless community that you all see every day and you drive by on your way to work or home. And uh, I think that we don't have enough representation on this panel of a large number of people representing all kinds of industry and uh, associations and so forth. Our representative for the houseless is uh, houseless right now. He's not here. And so I'm very concerned that the, uh, the needs and uh, the services that could be provided to the houseless are not really being discussed here. I know we've talked about housing for ELI, which is very important, uh, but we can't build it fast enough and we can't build enough of it. So we're going to continually to have a problem with people sleeping in the streets, sleeping under bridges, along the freeways, and in their cars, and in whatever they can do, wherever they can manage, because we're not addressing the problem. And I think that this is an, an opportunity to be able to actually look at that 
and try to understand what is causing this problem and how we can solve it. But you can't solve it by sitting around a table like this. You have to go out and meet the people where they are. You need to be able to have that conversation with them and find out what it is that got them to that point and what's going to help them get out of that so that we don't have this ongoing problem. So I deplore you all to please consider at least having a conversation with somebody living in the streets to find out exactly what's going on in their lives and how you can impact them positively in this conversation that we're not having here today. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Sandy Perry from the Affordable Housing Network. Uh, I attended three of the four community forums uh, last week, and all of them expressed concern and even fear about displacement. And so far, these fears have not been adequately addressed by the city staff or by Google. Is my letter, which I passed out to, I think, hopefully all of you earlier tonight, as it says, the city's uh, affordable housing and anti-displacement measures have so many holes, they look like Swiss cheese. I want to call attention to the article that was, uh, came out in the Atlantic a couple of days ago. It actually talks a lot about you here in the SOG. And uh, it has a title, it says, Who Gets to Live in Silicon Valley? And that's actually a, a fairly concise formulation of the problem. If this project continues as presently planned, it looks like there's going to be two kinds of people in San Jose, people who are considered deserving to live in San Jose and people who are considered undeserving and have to leave. Uh, and unless this attitude and this, pro and this project changes, it will divide our community by class and by color. And this is uh, kind of like the urban policy equivalent of Trump's latest uh, immigration policy, not only is he dividing up families, which will happen when families are displaced and people uh, have to leave their relatives and, and leave their parents in some cases, uh, but also uh, Trump is trying to put in a merit-based uh, immigration plan, which is based on how skilled a person is and uh, if, whether or not you come from Norway or one of the countries which he appears to favor. And actually, the tech industry, if you look at its history, it does tend to favor whites, and it favors people with specialized skills. This does not reflect our historic values in San Jose. Anyway, I think we're, we are making progress. Great discussion tonight. Uh, good work, uh, Lori, on summing up the housing group's uh, plans. And uh, let's move forward and make this work. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Next up is Blair, followed by Ramon Tostado and Adriano Rothschild. Hi, uh, thank you. <coughs> Can I mention, um, what did I want to mention? <coughs> I got a cough. Um, there has been, uh, uh, this group, it was talked about the ideas of development ideas, and uh, I, there was a meeting at the city council in San Jose yesterday where I think they pretty much specifically said there is not any promise of uh, uh, l uh, low income housing help for the high rise developments in the downtown area. And it was very notable. And the city of San Jose City Council is just learning to talk about what is going to be, you know, mixed income ideas for the downtown area. There's a few things that are already happening, uh, but it sounds like they're running pretty dry. On, on how to continue that and sustain those ideas. There's the VTA transit department, uh, you know, there's those sort of plans in the works, working along the transit routes and stuff like that. Uh, but besides that, um, I think I'm really learning to believe in the mixed use, uh, mixed use, but just uh, a mixture in the downtown area. The downtown area is important to me. It's, had, it's, it's quite a character, and it, uh, it should stay that way. I don't think it should be blanched out into this big, rich white man's dream, and uh, I'm worried about that. Please look at, if you can, uh, what the city of San Jose is actually doing with downtown right now. What, what, are the, what is the city of San Jose doing with their own gentrification plans downtown now uh, while we're planning these grand dreams for the future? 
you know, San Jose is doing something pretty serious that I hope you can really look into. I'm really not happy with what they're planning on doing. There's a way to go about this, this bridge to the future that needs to, what Robert Aguirre has said, it needs communication with people. It just needs people talking with each other. And I think it can accomplish a lot. And uh, you know my feelings about the big belly downtown. It's just a monster, I feel. And um, yeah, just good communication is all we need. And uh, please, please, there's a, there was a San Jose City Council uh, meeting on Monday to talk about downtown issues as well. So study these issues a lot. And there's a lot happening now that you need to look into. Thank you. Thanks, Blair. Next up is Ramon. Hello, my name is Ramon Tostado. I live uh, in the Almaden area uh, by Goodyear. And I'm just looking at the mixed housing unit as far as funding. I think with Google, that's not a problem. They have a lot of money. They could probably fund it all. Uh, so that probably wouldn't be a problem, but we just need the percentage of what is going to be affordable housing. And then the other one is uh, if it's going to happen. They need to have a certain percentage. I don't know if it's going to be 20%, but local workers first. Before they come from out of the country or out of the area, it should be local first. So these people have a chance to still stay in this area. And I mean, keep it San Jose first and help out with others, like he's talking about, homelessness here. We need to invest that money, whatever it is, to taking care of that problem. And if, I don't know if it was five years back or further, Google had 44 billion to play with. So there is not, this is an example we can use with this company to really help out. I mean, when you have companies that have more money than countries, where they can do something, they can have a major impact. And I think that's where it starts, is everyone wanting to help everyone, but everyone should rise up together. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ramon. Next up is Adriano, followed by Larry Ames and Adna Levy. Hi, I'm Adriano. Um, one of the things that was talked about today was that for every one new tech job, we have three or four service jobs that come and support it. And so I'm wondering if the city's current 15% affordable housing and urban village 25% affordable housing seems like enough. Because we're talking about for every one tech job, we have four non-tech jobs. That's four probably not six-figure salaries. Um, so just wanted to kind of get that out there and, and have that be a consideration. The point, the third point that you guys had was at least 25%, and I think that's an important wording choice, is at least 25%. And I think VTA's goal is to have 35% affordable housing. Um, I know there are a lot of complexities into what and how affordable housing is defined, but um, just wanted everyone to realize that 80% of the new jobs would not be tech industry jobs. So that's all. Great. Thanks, Adriano. Larry? So once again, I wrote a talk, and then others read my mind. I've got to think more quietly next time. So I'm going to echo uh, Stephen here. Uh, San Jose has a structural budget problem because San Jose is a bedroom community. The Envision 2040 had a goal of increasing the jobs per employed resident from the current, what is it, 0.8 up to about 1.1. If you build housing, you're going to be making that ratio worse. And if you just add jobs and housing, then you keep the ratio the same. You've just made the problem bigger. If you uh, build a lot of housing at uh, Deridon, people will use the transit and uh, go someplace else. They'll go up to San Francisco. So then they will be getting the tax revenues, and we still have to pay for the parks and library and the police. You want the transit to go from houses to jobs. You don't take transit to go from one house to another or from one job to another. It's, it's two ends of the line there. Um, you have the housing at the urban villages around the area and then the, on the transit corridors and then have them come into the Deirdon where you have the jobs at the Deirdon. And um, you want to have a balance. You do have to have some housing, but you want to balance it with the jobs. You want to be emphasis on the jobs. And I think it's always been hard to live in this area here. I mean, I remember coming here 39 years ago and I could barely afford to 
get a fixer upper in the, what was then an iffy neighborhood. And over the years, I, my wife worked too to be able to afford the place. And uh, over the years, we fixed up the place. Um, yes, I gentrified the place. The place had been a cannery community, but the canneries aren't there anymore. So jobs change. Jobs change, the cities change, the whole area changes. So what is gentrification? What is the changing of the cities? It's a complicated problem. I'm not offering solutions. I just say it's a complicated problem and you need balance and you need to be fair. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. And last up is Adna. We're running a little bit over time. We just have a couple slides at the end just to wrap up the meeting, if you could stick with us. Thank you very much, Adna. Hey, um, Adina Levin, and um, I am uh, usually speaking um, for Friends of Caltrain, which is a nonprofit supporting sustainable transportation, including transit oriented development on the Peninsula Corridor from San Francisco through San Jose. And while I'm informed by that work, I'm really speaking today as an individual. Um, and I want to address some of the things that have come up in this conversation um, with some uh, suggestions and, and, and questions. Um, so, one is somebody has a good question about, well, you know, sh shouldn't Dear Don, like you know, sitting with this great transit resource, be a job center and have everybody commute in. And the trend right now is to move away from that model to something that's a little bit more mixed. And whether it is in Mountain View, where they have a single use office park, which is completely dead at night, and now they're looking to make it into a mixed use neighborhood with some people living near where they work, or whether you're looking at, you know, like the Mission Bay area that's been really built out in San Francisco, and you go there at like on the weekend, you can't find anything to eat. You can't find like a sandwich shop open because even though it has a mix, it's still extremely jobs rich. And it's really healthy to have a 16 hour neighborhood that there's people around seven days a week, 16 hours a day, as opposed to something that is jobs only and then completely dead the rest of the time. Um, there is a good point to having housing in the transit shed so that you make really good use of jobs on the major transit, but people can also um, commute in. That's uh, another good idea, but having a 16-hour neighborhood is, is uh, good and important. Um, one question and concern that I have is that 35% below market rate um, housing seems reasonable and attainable, especially with you know, money coming from public sources, potentially from Google that's getting so much benefit from all the public infrastructure in the area. Um, but I would be much more nervous if it was ex an expectation that it would be 25% as essentially a tax on the, um, you know, on the private development. San Francisco set a 25% inclusionary rate, and that's been correlated with a severe slowdown in the creation of, of housing. So 25% overall with a variety of sources, good. 25% as inclusionary on the developer seems more um, a potential of a concern. And the last point I would like to make is this is not only a San Jose issue. And um, last night there were some people in a city that shall not be named but is one stop away on, the tr on a major transit line from here um, where they've been working on a development across the street from a major transit stop for five years or more and are considering further delay. And so there may be some regional policy things and or, and or statewide legislation things that could potentially help not only San Jose, but other cities uh, provide the housing that is needed. All right, so super quickly, the next advisory group meeting is coming up quickly July 9th. Uh, housing Solution Group number three, July 10th, and then a couple more meetings in August. And we'll be, oops, we'll be scheduling a mid-September one, uh, so look out for the invite on that. Um, reminder about our website. I'll be adding more things to it soon. Now that the forums are done, we'll be adding uh, more of the report back. Uh, written comments uh, can, if you have written comments, you're a member of the public, send them to me. Here's the address. And I believe that's it. Any questions before we adjourn? Nope. Okay. Adjourned. Thank you.